call to order the open session of the meeting. We've been meeting an executive session to discuss negotiations. So let me get my agenda out here. So as always, we're going to begin with any public input. Is anybody here to bring any matters from the public up? Okay. Seeing none, we'll move on to the student report. Just so we have with us what, Julia Thorstad, is that how we say it? Yes. <laughs> For the student report. First off, I'd like to start with a congratulations to the class of 2019 on a great year. Seniors finished their last day of school on Friday and senior week kicked off with the baccalaureate service on Sunday. Just an hour ago, they walked down the bus loop for the grand march of their final prom. Senior class officers have a great night planned at the Royal Senesta in Cambridge. Friday looks nice and sunny for graduation. For academic matters, sophomores finished their last round of MCAS testing when they took the math section on Chromebooks two weeks ago, testing them on Algebra 1 and Geometry. Freshmen have Biology MCAS Tuesday and Wednesday of this week. Another congratulations to students grades 9 through 12 who were recognized for their academic achievements at Student Recognition Night. The first recipients of the Seal of Biliteracy were acknowledged. It is designed to highlight and motivate students to achieve bilingualism in reading, writing, speaking, and listening. These seniors will be awarded at graduation. AP exam testing is finished with 417 exams administered this year. Underclassmen are finishing final projects and beginning to study for final exams. Exams start this Thursday on the 13th and end the following Tuesday the 18th. For athletic matters, Girls track won the D3 state championship at Merrimack College. They had a perfect season with zero losses, and it marks a perfect career for the graduating seniors who have been state champs for all four years. Ali Grasso, Caitlin Gorghini, and Izzy Perret have advanced to the New England championship based on their top three performances at All States Saturday. Several athletes will be advancing to nationals for track, including Ali Grasso, Caitlin Gorghini, Izzy Perret, Megan Lawler, Lindsay McClellan, and Billy Lord. The girls lacrosse team played their game against Malden Catholic with honorary captain Meredith Casey from the Mighty Meredith Project to raise awareness for traumatic brain injuries. And boys tennis qualified for the state tournament for the first time since 2014. For fine arts matters, maskers actors took part in the mock car crash demonstration given to juniors and seniors on May 23rd. The event is put on by the Students Against Destructive Decisions program, SAD, to communicate the dangers of driving while under the influence of alcohol and drugs. The marching band performed at the Memorial Day Parade, directed by drum major Jessica Palazzolo. Music boosters will be selling water and pre-sale Hornet seat cushions at graduation this Friday to keep the crowd comfortable. The Jazz Band and Notorious are holding auditions this week for their 2019 to 2020 members, respectively. There is a district-wide art show coming up that will be displayed on Main Street. Notorious and band took to Six Flags to perform at the New England-wide competition called Music in the Parks. It was a great day for all the musicianists as chorus placed first and band placed third. Stephen Flurry was awarded Best Soloist. For extracurricular activities, the Student Leadership and Mentoring Club, SAD, just had SLAM, sorry, just had their annual two days of training at the Aldersgate Church. The 60 mentors in the club met with former mentors Deb and Dana to develop leadership skills they will be using to guide the incoming freshman class next year. The Students Against Destructive Decisions Club, SAD, is hosting Dr. Pinkney, an expert on domestic violence and criminology, to provide an interactive presentation on domestic violence awareness. Students are able to sign up to watch during Power Block. Student Council finished running elections for freshmen, sophomores, and juniors to make Student Council or become a class officer. Other clubs have spent their end of the year meetings recognizing seniors for their dedication and accomplishments and announcing results from elections for new officers. New officers will be taking over for the remaining school year. And for my piece of student work, I chose an activity that we did in English about the curious incident of the dog in the nighttime. That's a mystery murder mystery novel about a boy named Christopher with Asperger's. And the activity was done to pick an image that represents an obstacle in Christopher's life. And then you we elaborate on if he overcame the obstacle or not. And we did them on um, Google Slideshow using the iPads. 
And it was a very nice activity because Miss Babcock kind of wanted us to write freely and kind of be creative while staying on task. So I can pass around that criteria in the actual Thanks. presentation. Excellent. Thank you. Anybody have comments or questions? Have the, do you, or, you know, Ms. Bernard, have the maskers been involved in any other training programs since the one they came to us about in that was either on Nantucket or Martha's Vineyard? I forget which. No, none since that. No, the only other one I'm aware of this year is the one that took place for their preparation for the um, for the mock crash. For the mock crash. Yeah. I, I just, that program. Which was always, at Anscom Air Force Base. That always fascinates me. Fabulous. It's such a great yeah. use, um, extra use of them. Mr. Buckley, could I just yeah, offer? Sure. I, I, I'd like to just give a quick context to something that Julia mentioned because I think it speaks to something very important about, about our students at the high school. Um, and it's about the AP exams. And, and it's when, when I started here in North Reading in 2003, we had we administered 87 uh, advanced placement exams um, in my first year. And if, I, I think you all perked up a little bit when you heard Julia mention that there were 417 exams administered. And I believe that's over 17 courses that we now offer too, which as opposed to eight. And I, I think it's important to just highlight that a little bit because I think it speaks to something very important about our students and their willingness to challenge themselves at a very high level with the most rigorous courses that we offer. And I appreciate Julia bringing that up because I know it, it, it also presents a lot of stress for kids. And um, it's been a stressful couple of weeks as they've engaged in those AP exams. But I think in the end, uh, it says something very important about them. And I, I just wanted to call a little extra attention to that. Thank you very much. Did you take AP? Yeah, I took AP Environmental Science. So I had that exam this year. Was it fun? <laughs> it was actually the exam was the exam was I think better than anything I took all year just because she like she really wanted to make it hard so that we knew what we were getting into but the exam was pretty like it was a pretty like good wrap up of what I learned so I actually didn't have much stress while I was taking it I think like the midterm was actually hard harder for me Very good. and an interesting thing about that course did you get the, the tour of the wastewater treatment plant this year yeah. Yeah. They they do an annual tour of the wastewater treatment plant oh, yeah. that services this building, which is I think that's been going on since we've been in this building. It's mm -hmm. pretty. It's always one of the kind of the highlights of the, the sort of field trips that that course takes. I learn a lot from Ms. Car Ms. Kerrigan, right? Ms. Kerrigan. Uh, yes. Her uh, Twitter feed. She's always. She is. Yeah. Good. Very active. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> We're going to move on. A lot of guests here today, so we're going to skip over continued business and go to Mr. McManus. Mr. McManus, the presentation for uh, Special Education Parent Advisory Council. Of course. Come on in. I appreciate the opportunity to collaborate in the planning and coordination of CPAC sponsored events. And I'm very excited and looking forward to our continued work together in the upcoming year ahead. So I will turn it over to Steve. Thank you, Cynthia. Is this uh, turned on correctly? It, it, that's uh, just for the TV, so yeah, yeah. not for the room. Oh, okay. You don't hear anything, it's okay. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. All right, fantastic. Um, Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, as my name is Steve McManus, and I'm the president of the CPAC, North Reading Special Education Parent Advisory Council. Uh, I'm here to, today to talk about who we are, uh, how we've been active this past year, and what our goals are for next year. So as an introduction, our duties include, but are not limited to, uh, advising the district on matters that pertain to the education and safety of students with disabilities, meeting regularly with school officials, uh, participating in the planning, development, and evaluation of the school district's special education programs, and to advocate for the appropriate supports and special education services necessary to meet the individual needs of children with disabilities living in the district and to ensure that each child receives the individualized supports and special education services that such child is entitled to under applicable law, both federal and state laws. And students that fall into this category have been determined to have a disability and that disability requires special education. So uh, the way that I sort of describe our group to uh, new parents coming in is like every school has a parent association. We're a district-wide parent association focused on special education. Um, 
So to that end, we've uh, we've had a busy year, probably our busiest year that uh, that we've had since I've been involved with the group, uh, and we do a lot of activities that are geared towards special education, but the general population of students and families as well. Uh, the first program of our year was held in October, and we did something new to kick the year off. We had a more casual meeting at uh, in a non-school setting, uh, and this worked out really well. It was a pretty casual, laid-back atmosphere to, for parents to get together and sort of had a different vibe than, than meeting in this room. Um, it was We called it a kickoff coffee talk, and uh, it was a great way for parents in our group to make uh, informally network with each other, meet other parents with children in the special education program and to make connections. Uh, we had a, uh, my co-chair and I, Vicki Labriola, also did a small presentation and gathered ideas from other parents as to what sort of programming uh, that they would like to see and many volunteered to help, which was really nice, uh, help implement some of those programming ideas. And it was also at, after this event that uh, Scott offered to serve as the liaison between the school board and the CPAC. In November, we hosted a financial planner and lawyer to discuss financial and estate planning for families and children with special needs. And then in December, we held our required uh, basic rights in special education workshop. With the support of the school district and PPS department, we are a paid member of the MassPAC, which is a <coughs> statewide uh, sort of collaborative or umbrella organization for each individual town's CPAC. Um, they provide information, training, and networking opportunities to uh, to groups like ours and professionals who, who we work with. As part of this membership, we had a speaker from the MassPAC come out and present uh, this workshop to our group. Actually, we've had uh, this particular speaker out a few times, and um, she's really good, so we always request her availability for, for the, uh, the presentations. Uh, to start off the 2019 calendar year, we held another informal off-site meeting to check in with parents uh, to talk about how the year was going so far and to get ideas for programming for the, the rest of the year. Uh, March was really busy for us. Our two biggest events of the year were actually held in March. Uh, a big concern to, you know, obviously everyone, but also special ed is sort of emergency preparedness and uh, responsiveness for, for schools. Uh, so on March 7th, we hosted a forum discussing uh, emergency preparedness geared more towards special education students. I know there was a workshop uh, last year that was geared towards the general population, but our group has some specific concerns that we thought might be best addressed in a, in a smaller group setting. Uh, so I'd definitely like to give thanks to Cynthia for helping organize this event. Um, our panel consisted of school resource officer, Detective Lucci, uh, Detective Sean O'Leary, Deputy Fire Chief Barry Galvin, Firefighters Vin Zarella and Brian Nash, uh, Middle School Assistant Principal Michael Maloney, and Secondary Coordinator of Special Education Maureen Ryan. So uh, you can imagine the number of emails and coordination it took to put that together. So thank you, <laughs> Cynthia. Uh, each member of the panel gave an introduction to themselves and an overview of how either they individually and or their department is involved in planning, uh, emergency planning in a school setting and parents in attendance were able to ask questions about this important topic. And we had a really nice uh, sort of concrete takeaway from this was that uh, it came up during the Q&A session that parents are able to register um, their children with the police department. So, you know, God forbid, in the case of an emergency, either at school or even at home, you can fill out a piece of paper, register your child with the police department, so that way, if there's an emergency, the police has some background information on that child. And so what we've done is, at subsequent events, we've had those forms available for parents to fill out and either mail or drop off at the police station. So uh, nice added, added peace of mind there. Uh, on March 28th, we hosted Lynn Lyons, who's a very popular speaker who presented on the topic, Anxious Kid, Anxious Parents, Strategies to Interrupt the Worry Cycle. Uh, we organized this event with several other stakeholders in town, including the North Reading Community Impact Team, the uh, trustees of the Flint Memorial Library, Who's Learning Now, and the North Suburban Child and Family Resource Network. Uh, we had close to 300 students and parents uh, in attendance. We went, moved down to the Performing Arts Center, uh, and the speaker was very well received. We started planning this event last summer, but it's been on our radar screen for a couple years to host Miss Lyons, and the event went off really well. Um, and we actually had high school students who were able to usher the event for their service hours. And it's a big goal of ours to be able to collaborate with stakeholders both within the school district but community-wide. So it was nice to work together with a lot of groups. Um, the library had a table. 
outside the auditorium with like you could check out books from the library about anxiety and they they had the books with them which was nice i didn't even know you could check out books unless you were at the library so it was a nice surprise um in march i attended the federation for children with special needs workshop it was a day-long workshop in boston on a saturday uh, which was a great event for networking meeting leaders from other cpacs and bringing resources back to north reading we also participated last August in the uh, North Reading National Night Out. We had a table and we had a informational table at Parent University as well, which we look forward to continuing to participate in. Uh, from a programming perspective, we wrapped up the year in late April with another speaker from the Federation for Children with Special Needs. Uh, the topic she covered was suspension and discipline in special education. Uh, she did an excellent job going over the rules and regulations of this topic. And you know, all of our workshops are posted on the website so we actually had some people from uh, other towns coming because they had questions about that topic that they didn't necessarily want to ask in their own district so it was nice to be able to branch out and meet some other people as well um, we do have an active website that Vicki uh, Labriola and her husband Jason worked a lot of hours to maintain and I wanted to share an example of an outreach we got through that uh, website from a parent in town hi mr. McManus uh, I'm a mentor for my local library's after-school program where I'm working with middle and high school students. My mentees and I started off our school year by talking about peer pressure and bullying. I thought it would be a great topic, great starting topic because it's important conversation for their age group and it offers some great getting to know everybody kind of activities. Uh, our first activity was to work with a person you've never met and do some research on this topic. Our group found your webpage while doing some research and we found the information very helpful. Uh, two students came across another helpful article that we wanted to share with you uh, to include on your own website. Uh, the article was found by younger kids who are very quiet, and I'd love to show them that they're great researchers and create great digital content. Uh, it would definitely make them feel a bit more confident. So we did, in fact, uh, post that on our website. Um, so looking forward to the summer and into next year, I'll be serving on the uh, superintendent search committee. Uh, and we're also looking at, uh, this was a, a nice parent idea, Lighted Up Blue Project in North Reading. Uh, one of our um, parents uh, has family in Stoneham, and I guess in every, every April for uh, Autism Awareness Month, the, the town center in Stoneham has blue Christmas lights, and there's like the, the town hall and schools put up blue light bulbs just to sort of acknowledge in um, Autism Awareness Month. So we have a parent who's volunteered to uh, head up those efforts. Uh, which we're excited about and um, just in closing last but not least I'd certainly like to thank uh, Vicki Labriola the co-chair of our group who certainly does a lot of work uh, uh, along with me she couldn't be here tonight but I definitely wanted to thank her uh, also uh, John for your support over the years and I've been I also attend his his um, by bi monthly parent meetings of his superintendent's parent advisory council. And as always, you and your, your team have been nothing but supportive of our efforts. So thank you for your ongoing partnership over the last few years. Um, and we also have a very, very collaborative and positive relationship with Cynthia and her whole team. You guys are always very supportive of what we're doing as well. So certainly can't be understated. And I know that's not uh, necessarily true in all districts based on what I've heard from networking. So it's not certainly not something we take for granted. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. McManus. Thank Anybody you. Have... <laughs> Any comments or questions from the committee? Steve, you, uh, how do you feel reach, uh, outreach is in North Reading? Do, you, do people know the, about the resource, about your group, and, and or do you find people reaching out on a regular basis? Um, yeah, definitely more so. Um, you know, Vicki is the, she runs our uh, Facebook page. Mm. So she, I know she does a lot of active postings and with articles and, and advertising the events that we have. So I know that's a, a, that's a great way to do it. It's, um, but that's why we really focused also on the Parent University and the National Night Out to get the table and, and just sort of make ourselves a presence for whoever uh, needs our help that we're out there and visible and certainly, you know, trying to trying to be an active resource for families in the community great i mean i i would just say personally i think i think you're a perfect person for this position steve i mean you you and vicky work very well together you spend so much time on putting things together and you just at every event you try to you know get to make 
make sure people can connect with each other. You ask, you know, what's going on. You're just a very supportive person. Yeah, I mean, we're just so lucky to have you in this district. And I mean, we ask you, we ask a lot of you. I mean, you're on different councils. You're helping the, the superintendent search now. And I mean, we're just really, really thankful, we're lucky to have you in this district. So thank you so much for the time and the hours that you put in for this. And please extend that to Vicki as well. I will. Thank you. Well, I know I can speak for myself and certainly my wife, Deb. We love this district. We're, we're thrilled with the services here. Um, you know, we feel very fortunate that, uh, you know, we moved here before we had kids. And when you have kids, you obviously you're looking for a town and you research the school district. You don't necessarily think you need to resource the special education department of that district. That thought never crossed our minds. So we're certainly... Uh, feel very fortunate and, and blessed to live in a town with such a great and active uh, special ed department so and school district overall. Yeah. Well, thank you. Any Mr. Cockley, if I could just quickly add, and echo your comments and those of, of Mrs. Conant, that Steve, you are a pleasure to work with, and I appreciate all that you and your very small but hardworking group of people do um, to support all of our students. It has been a pleasure. Uh, Steve, when he, Steve got into this, he didn't know it was a lifetime appointment. <laughs> <laughs> Keep trying. We had this conversation on Friday. Yeah, right. Um, but he, you have done a wonderful job, and I appreciate everything. And I know Cynthia works with you much more closely than I do. But uh, please know that um, what you do does not was, does not go unnoticed or unappreciated. So thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. It's been great working with you. And thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank okay, you. Okay. So moving on. Apparently, people want to leave our district at times when they uh, want to retire. We have one person tonight who I think I know since all three of my kids have had her. Um, this is Aldrich, and He's great. Thank you. I don't know if Mr. Bernard wants to present or, or speak or, no. I'd be happy to. You'd like to? I feel like I'm working a game show tonight. <laughs> um, I have the pleasure of acknowledging uh, Debbie Aldrich, who is here with her husband, Mark. She's hiding up the back there, but I'm not going to let her hide too long. Um, I will just speak briefly, and I don't know, Mrs. Molly, if you might want to add a few words as, as the building principal at the little school. But I have had the good fortune of knowing uh, Mrs. Aldrich, first as a parent of students that came through the high school when I was the principal, um, and more recently have had the, uh, the good fortune of, um, of seeing her work in action as a kindergarten teacher at the little school. One of my favorite things to do when I go into any of our schools is to, is to visit classrooms and see students engaged in their work with their teachers. And um, one of the highlights of um, the, the, the phrase controlled chaos comes into mind when I visit your classroom. And I say that with all due compliment and respect, but they just, it is, did you really? Is that great? No, it's, it's just, it, as you can imagine, it's, it's a kindergarten classroom, and I just have such admiration for the work that, that all of our teachers do. But I have long believed that uh, kindergarten teachers especially really put children on a course for the rest of their schooling, certainly, and, 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 and even beyond. Um, Douglas. Is a, is a favorite. You knew I was going to bring that up, didn't you? She, at, at Christmas time, she has this, uh, this, I don't know what you even call it, a dancing, yeah, it's a Douglas fir, but it's, it's, a, it's a tree mm -hmm. that, that is near the door and it detects motion when you come in and out and it starts to do a little dance and the kids used to, you know, they've always gotten a great, um, a great kick out of my reaction to it, so we used to play that up. But um, Debbie, you, you've been a wonderful employee of the district for over 20 years, 20 years as a kindergarten teacher, but um, my understanding is just for a few, three years before that, you were working as a, a paraprofessional in the special education department, and I just have such, um, such gratitude to you for the wonderful, wonderful work that you've done, and I wish you all the best in your retirement, so congratulations. And there is um, a tradition in North Reading that <laughs> we ask our retiring staff to, um, to identify a book that they would like to have placed in um, a library in honor of their service to the district. So um, Debbie has, has chosen probably a book that we're all familiar with, The Polar Express. And my administrative assistant does a nice job in ordering all the books. And she's created a little, kind of a little badge inside here, Debbie, that, that dedicates this book um, in your honor um, as a kindergarten teacher at the E. Ethel Little School. And I will give this to Mrs. Molly to have placed in the library. And the reason that, that Debbie um, selected the Polar Express, and I'm going to quote her, we, we asked the question, why is this book one of, your, one of your favorites? And what she wrote was, because the story is about believing. Believing means hope. This world could use more believing in magic and hope. Certainly that's a very, very nice positive message for you to convey, Debbie. So, so thank you very much. And I know the committee um, has a gift for you here, and I have a feeling they may want to 
have you come down here to join them, and then maybe Mrs. Molly might, I don't want to put you on the spot, Chris, but do you want to say anything? Yes. Yeah? So this is a gift that the committee may want to present to you. Shall I open it for him? Uh, you're, you're, you're welcome to do that, sure, however you want to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Photo? Sure. I think, uh, Jill, you, are you able Jill, to? Jill, you photo? Do you want to, do you want to gather? Do you want to come up? Come, come, come around front. Is the committee gathering? Yeah. Maybe you have front one here. Yeah. Do you want to have Mark come down? Yeah. yeah. Come on down. Stay front. I think we're going to come right in front here, Deb. Oh, okay. Just don't drop it now. I know. Yes. <laughs> you notice they're all telling me don't drop it? Because they all know me. That's right. <laughs> yeah. I was with Joyce Lorton and we, we wanted to know where you stood. Thank you. This is beautiful. We did. <laughs> we did. We all make some we signed you. Okay. We all make some signatures. And we signed your we signed your petition. Thank you. Thank you for it. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Buckley, if you don't mind, we did, you know, it's, it's, it's a busy time of year, as you can imagine. So what, what we did do is um, we did invite, we have three other teachers that are retiring from the district this year as well. Um, Nancy Badavis, who has worked at the, um, at the little school for 15 years. Maeve Bradley, who has worked at the little school for 20 years. And Mary Hayden, um, who is retiring after 16 years as a speech language pathologist at the Batchelder School. They unfortunately had um, conflicts with being here this evening. And then... <laughs> when, the, um, when the committee meets on June 17th, we will have uh, a number of folks here from the middle school and the high school um, to be recognized as well. So that's coming in a couple of weeks. Yes, and, and, and I know this is something that a couple of years ago, Julie Kopke was on the school committee, suggested that we do a little bit more to recognize the people that are retiring. So I'm glad that we do take the time to do that. So thank you very much. And Seems like a lot of the little school wants to go out on top. We won, <laughs> won some awards this year and everybody wants to retire now, so. Okay, so I guess we can move on. So we are fortunate to have all the uh, principals of the elementary schools here tonight. So we have some school improvement plans to be presented and I don't know if there's a specific order that people are going in. I don't know, they, they, there they we usually, go. They usually are you do doing a little, it together? Uh, yeah, they do a, okay. yeah, a joint. Are we gonna move up to the stands here? Sure. I'm gonna move up. I'm gonna give. You move up here. I'm going to bring your microphones with you. So just this is a Norcam, okay? Bring your mic. Hello, sir. How are you? Very good, thank you. I can sit here. I know. I'm asking lots of questions. Sure, Mike. Eight o'clock. Because you see a lot of things. Yeah. Thank you. See you. Thank you very much. I'm fine. Too. I keep the seat. Thank you again. I can I can look at the folks like in the face, uh, and I can look at the thing without moving. When you I can't imagine. We have to do so much. Can't imagine. Okay. We all should be able to see each other. Way up in the back. It's not a big deal. Way in the back here. We all set? Good. How do I switch it? Thank you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for having us tonight. I'm very sorry to say that this is our last evening presenting our school improvement plans with Mr. Bernard at the helm, so we'll miss you, John. Um, we'd like to start out with just a quick review of the NRPS 2021 Common Core Goals and Focus Areas. Um, 
class size. We recognize and value the importance of class size and composition as important factors that contribute to student success. Accountability, a 25% increase in the number of students scoring in the meeting and exceeding expectations categories for all students participating in the standard ELA math and math MCAS, thus decreasing the number of students in the partially meeting and not meeting categories. And lastly, data-driven decision-making, utilizing multiple sources of data as a means of improving student achievement and enhancing student learning. What am I doing? There you go. Thank you, Mrs. Molly. So we have the pleasure of going together to do our presentations, but that's, that's also sort of planned in the sense that You'll see that each school has its own little flavor to things, but you'll see that many of the themes and activities that we engage in carries across all three schools. So each school has a little twist on a thing, but all the goals are the same and they're all based on um, all the evaluation tools that we use. So you'll see the same format carried throughout the presentation as well. So I'd like to start off by thanking um, my school council members. So I had Mrs. Wright as my faculty representative, she's a first grade teacher. I had Mrs. Lisa Santilli, um, a local um, real estate agent in town as my community representative. Miss mm -hmm. Leanne Mahoney was another faculty representative, um, first um, special education teacher. Um, myself, um, Mrs. Hewlett, um, parent representative, and Mrs. Del Rossi, another parent representative. So lucky to have a, a great group to work with and, and get through the process and really focus on what we can do to improve student learning at the Hood School. Um, always like try to tell a story with that picture that we put on the front cover of my school improvement plan so that that on the left is our student council uh, doing the annual toys for tots collection with um and then the donation at the end to um, the north reading fire department who takes it over and delivers it for us so one of those nice little traditions the student council carries throughout the presentation so and when we talk about the goals you'll see them weaved in as well so highlights um, many people in this room know that we talk a lot about co-teaching and shared responsibility at the Hood School, so that's been a continued focus, and that usually leads to discussions around our subgroup ratings and subgroup categories um, on the accountability system. So we continue to talk about our high needs subgroup a lot and how we can improve the student learning outcomes for them. Makerspace days are huge events at the Hood School. In fact, we have one on Friday. Um, those are fun community building days where where students from across grade levels kind of get mixed up and they get to work in different grade levels um, with different students and we do that under the guise of, yeah, that teaches leadership and a lot of teamwork stuff, but it also builds community because everybody gets to know everybody else. Um, then we had us implemented this year as a result of the school improvement plan, school-wide community meetings or SRR days. So SRR is kind of like our behavioral framework at the Hood School, so safe, responsible, and respectful. Um, those are how how we frame anything that goes on at the Hood School. So those school-wide community building days, we did, I believe, five of them this year. So um, it was quite an achievement for us. And then our science outcomes that we'll talk about as we go through the presentation, we obviously we were, we were very excited to, to receive recognition and the accountability system under um, the science outcomes this year. So the goal for teaching and learning. We kind of talked a little bit about it when Mrs. Molly did the introduction. You'll see the goal is the same across the three elementary schools. It's, it's basically ELA and math, a 25% decrease in the number of students scoring in the partially meeting or not meeting categories for all students participating in the standard ELA MCAS and, or math MCAS. Um, and the way it's worded, you can flip it each way. It just, it, the mathematically, it still works out the same. So focus areas under the goal heading of number one for teaching and learning for us. We'll continue to focus on the implementation of best practices to meet the needs of all learners this year. We'll focus on the updated accountability guidelines and procedures associated with that. Um, I want to spend a little bit of time this year focusing on that and it's just one of those big picture things that takes time and experience and a lot of discussion around. So we're going to continue forward with that. As previously mentioned, data driven decision making is always a goal at the Hood School. So whenever we make a decision, it's a, what data point is that based on and why are we doing that? Um, continued implementation of our co-teaching model across all grade levels, a continued focus on push-in service delivery model as opposed to when students receive services of pulling them out and putting them in a different setting and providing them instruction, try to keep kids in the least restrictive environment possible at the Hood School um, to the degree that they can handle. 
and an increased focus on mathematics and school culture. So we recognized early on when the accountability data came up this year that you know, we, we had some growth opportunities specifically in math achievement. So you'll see that I, I, you take an idea from one of your friends, but I, I loved Mr. Colleen's goal of analyzing the DART data, and I know you'll talk a little bit about that, but we copied that and did our little DART excursion and realized that we need to improve um, our focus on math and school culture. Management and operations, so how do we provide a safe learning environment for all children? So we'll continue our focus on school-wide SRR program, including our high five wall of fame, so students randomly, well, teachers catch students, quote unquote, engaging in safe, responsible, and respectful behavior. They turn in a slip with their name on it and what they were caught doing, and then at the end of each month, we randomly draw some names out of a hat, and those students get selected to put their hand and paint and put it on the high five wall of fame in our cafetorium. I'm, I'm curious as to how much more space we're going to have, so sooner or later I'm gonna have to paint the cafetorium and all those hands are gonna get covered up, but as of right now, we're pretty much three quarters of the way around, so it's pretty exciting. It's great to see their little faces. I try to put those pictures on Twitter, so if anybody really wants to grab those off and take a look at them, they're, they're great little snapshots of a moment in time at the Hood School. Um, we'll continue with our school-wide community meetings. We have a renewed focus on the school schedule, construction maximizing uninterrupted blocks of learning time. I spent a lot of time looking at 90-minute opportunities of uninterrupted learning. Um, we did a pretty good job at that, but lately we've been, things have been shifting and we're trying to understand why and trying to figure out a formula as to how we can maximize that time. Each time that they move or do a transition, it breaks that into uninterrupted learning time and how do we minimize those? Um, through the implementation of a school schedule. And I'll talk a little bit about our faculty study groups as, as we go forward in the presentation. Um, we had a culminating faculty meeting today around this and each group gets to present their findings for the year, so definitely an interesting day. Family and community engagement, so educating children is a community effort involving parents as well as the community resources. It provides continual reinforcement of academic and social ideals embraced by the school and the community. So focus areas for us would be to increase stakeholder outreach and engagement through the use of technology, most, mostly our school website and, and our Twitter feed. We'll continue with our grade five student council. This year money was raised for various charities. That I try to quantify a dollar value and we just couldn't do it. They just always collected money or a fundraiser for something great or collecting toys for tots or all sorts of activities. So. Um, Definitely great. This year we had a school-wide fundraiser for a family in need. That kind of took our, took our focus. Um, and it was definitely a fun time. It led to many of the Hood School teachers delivering pizzas um, around town to various Hood School families as part of that process. <laughs> um, continue work with our Eagle Scout on our shed project. So we're currently working with an, a local Eagle Scout to get a shed installed in the grounds of the Hood School. It's been a fun process. And we will work hand in hand with our parents association to achieve the goals of the school. So I spent a lot of time, how can we work with our parents association? They do so much for us and they fund so much and we're so appreciative of it. All right down to every one of our enrichment opportunities, but the addition of um, how do we shift towards a math culture and those things that some of these things take funding, particularly our maker space. There's always, there's always a check to be cut for some sort of maker space activity. So I love that my, my parents association has embraced those two ideas, particularly the maker space is always willing to, to help us fund that, that endeavor. So professional culture, our goal would be to implement our philosophy of working together as a learning community to foster high performance climate, a high performance climate focused on student learning. So we're always asking ourselves, what are we doing and how is it impacting student outcomes of student learning? <coughs> Focus area. Continue with our faculty study groups on various topics. So this year, we focused on makerspace, school climate, co-teaching, de-escalation techniques, and exploring online resources. And today we had our final wrap-up faculty meeting on these topics, and each group got to present. So the theory on that is, is that we all kind of sit down and we all work together to become specialists in one thing, and then share it out with the group and, and see how we can improve our practice as a whole in the building. Um, so they collected this year, they collected some school climate data. Um, they presented it today, but it was pretty raw and it was pretty, um, 
early on, so I think that we're going to take that year next year to digest what that data really says and, and talk about how we can improve in that area, as well as we'll continue to enhance our DART analysis and site visits. So, so this year we, we looked at some of our, our, math, our math scores and we took a little trip out to a school in Foxborough and kind of grab, wrap our minds around what they're doing differently than we're doing to get a different outcome than we got. And I would like to introduce Mrs. Molly. Thank you, Dr. McKay. You didn't change your slide to include the doctor. <laughs> uh, I too would also like to thank my school council members, Linda, Linda Emery, parent representative, Jennifer Vant, also a parent representative, <coughs> Harry Fleck is a teacher representative and also the co-chair. Uh, she's also my principal designee. And Patricia Elwell, a first grade teacher in my building, is also a teacher representative. We've had a little difficulty finding a community representative. I think I'm going to follow Mr. McKay's lead next year and put an ad in the newspaper to try to find somebody to be our community representative. Glenn, how am I doing this? Oh, okay. So some of the highlights from 2018, 2019. It was a very busy year at school. It's amazing how fast the year went by. Um, we had an enormous focus on social, social emotional learning and positive behavior intervention and supports. We formed a school-based social emotional learning committee that meets monthly. We're um, actually doing a book group uh, on a book called Grit by Angela Duckworth. Um, for the first time, we had a co-taught classroom in grade four this year. Uh, it was a self-contained classroom. Typically, we've we um, have not been self-contained in grade four, but we thought with trying the co-taught it would be the smartest move, so we tried that this year. Um, my observations when I visit classrooms have been on um, universal design for learning strategies, science, and social-emotional social learning strategies being implemented in the classrooms. Um, we have ongoing grade level collaborations and expanded use of data, data days to look at student data. And our facilities upgrades have included um, a, a lot of new safety equipment. Thank you, Mr. Bernard and uh, Mr. Conley and the grant that came our way. Um, we have new cameras, new classroom door locks, new doors in certain areas, new defibrillators, stop the bleed kits. And if you ask the students at school what the most important addition to the school was this year, they will tell you it was our new Gaga pit, which was provided through the generosity of the fabulous little school PTO. And we're very grateful for all the work they do. This year, it is our year. Every two years, we do a drama production. And this year, we're happy to say that the production will take place on June 14th and 15th at the uh, Middle School High School Performing Arts Center. And the fourth and fifth graders will be performing the Little, Mi Little Mermaid Junior. So we hope that if you have nothing going on that weekend, you come on out and join us for the production. And lastly, um, I'm almost a little, I don't know, I get a little nervous when I say things like this, but proudly um, we were nominated as a National Blue Ribbon School. We will find out sometime in the early school year, I believe, September, um, and find out if we were actually, if we are, are getting the award, but it's, it's been an honor to just be nominated. And also, we were recognized as one of the 51 schools in Massachusetts as a school of recognition. Um, I'm not going to go through the goals because they're the same goals that, Mr., uh, that Dr. McKay, um, and, and you'll see them in Mr. Colleen's presentation as well. But just for teaching and learning, our focus areas have been data-driven decisions to continue the response to intervention, our RTI. Um, tiered and flexible groupings in reading for grades K to two, uh, Title I math instruction in grades three to five. And this year, for a number of, a variety of reasons, for this coming year, we are going to return grade four to the departmentalized model, which means that there will be a dedicated teacher for math, a dedicated teacher for science, and a dedicated teacher for social studies. We are implementing year two of Empowering Writers with a focus on narrative writing. We're getting some new materials in and there'll be additional training for staff. 
We are continuing to educate the staff on social emotional learning and the importance of that in everything we do, not just as a particular program, but really blended into everything we do in the classroom. Uh, we are continuing to roll out our school expectations and a positive behavior intervention and support system. And we're encouraging our faculty to continue to do peer observations um, in classrooms. They get so much out of visiting um, one of the peers' classrooms and, and, and just being a part of what goes on next door when you really don't sometimes know what's going on next door. It's very valuable for teachers to see each other teach and to, and to debrief after they've witnessed a lesson. Um, very, very valuable for the faculty, so we're encouraging that to continue and even increase next year. And the hiring and reassignment of staff is ongoing, and we've had a lot of it at the little school, as you've heard. Um, but this is due to fluctuating enrollments. We went from one kindergarten this year to three kindergartens next year, and, um, and three retirements in the building. So we are almost done hiring. I hate to say that because something always happens during the summer, but we're getting close. Uh, management and operations to provide a safe learning environment for all children. Our focus areas are to continue year two of our social emotional committee. Uh, to have our faculty and staff continue to participate in the district-wide pause group um, where we're working on a rubric for, um, for discipline in the elementary schools, a kind of a kid-friendly, faculty-friendly rubric so that if there's some kind of um, issue on the playground, then what is the, you know, what is the, the consequence for that action? Um, and the continuation of the PBIS implementation and, um, the, and, and the teaching of student expectations for all of our students in all areas of the school uh, and the, the school facility. Universal Design for Learning, we had um, a, a week of mentorship this year. It was very well received in the building. The teachers enjoyed it very much. Uh, and so we're encouraging um, our, our mentors in the building to work with faculty to continue the universal design for learning approach and continuing to encourage peer observations. And lastly, we're going to continue with our top dog student recognition for good leadership and citizenship. And we've implemented a new ticket system for almost like a caught being good kind of um, behavior uh, system, which we began just in the cafeteria at the end of this school year. Next year, we'll be implementing uh, more areas in the building, such as the hallways and what's appropriate bus room behavior and things like that. Um, family and community engagement. Our focus areas are to encourage parent involvement in committees and events at school, such as PTO, school council, our school-wide makerspace activities, mystery readers, parents on parade. We just love having parents in the building and we encourage parents to come as much and as often as they can. Um, we're going to reestablish the school council guest speaker st series. So every month when we had school council year before last, we invited somebody to come and speak about something that we thought was appropriate that um, you know, would be in informational for our school council, so don't be surprised if some of you might get an invitation to come and speak. Um, and encourage the expanded use of Twitter for staff and parents as a social media tool and also as a learning tool. Um, and to encourage participation in curriculum nights and other school activities throughout the school year. And lastly, professional culture. Implementing our philosophy of working together as a learning community to foster a high-performance climate focused on student learning. Our focus areas work with the leadership team to improve faculty relationships, including team building opportunities throughout the year, encourage learning op opportunities through community service, staff and students. We do a lot of community service, a lot of, um, we have jean Fridays where everybody donates a dollar or so if they want to wear jeans on Friday. And, but along with that, we've invited um, some guest speakers to come in from the American Heart Association to teach the children about what it means to have a healthy lifestyle, how to improve your heart health, and then to also connect that fundraising to that learning opportunity. 
um, encourage, again, the faculty peer observations and debriefing, encourage ongoing professional development, including book studies, webinars, and most importantly, for faculty to come back to the staff and share what they've learned. And lastly, to, con to continue to improve communication between the administration, teachers, and paraprofessionals. Every morning at 6.30, I send a text message to every paraprofessional in the building, letting them know what's going on for the day. Because there was feedback that they felt a little bit disconnected and didn't always know if somebody was out or if there was a, somebody wasn't going to be on duty that morning. So every morning at 6.30, I send out a, a, a group text message to all the paras, letting them know who's out, who won't be at a particular duty, how we're going to cover, cover certain you know, lunch blocks and, and whatnot. And they really have appreciated being kept in the loop. And that is it. Mr. Colleen. Clock is on. 7.31. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd really like to take a moment to thank my school council member, members. Uh, Tina Borick is our facu faculty representative and co-chair. Mr. Eric Evans is our parent representative and secretary. Um, Mr. Evans is a parent of a fifth grade student, so he will be um, finishing up, or actually has finished up for the Bachelor School Council, unless I talk him into becoming a community rep, but I think he has aspirations of helping the middle school at some point. Um, Mrs. Sarah Harrington is a parent representative. Um, Mrs. Marianne Lape is our community representative who was a reading specialist at our school uh, when I first started as principal. And Sandra O'Connell is a faculty representative as well. Um, highlights, you know, you, you're getting a great results from all the elementary schools on um, the state standardized testing. Um, our schools have been recognized for high achievement. Uh, the bachelor school is also recognized for exceeding its targets. Um, also, along with some of the work in the, with the Hood School and the science, um, scored very well in the fifth grade science test in 2018. Um, we celebrate that with our students and as a faculty and staff. Uh, just to validate the work that goes in every day. Uh, we understand that it is one <coughs> set of data and we never um, rest our laurels on that alone, but it is nice to be recognized um, by the state. Um, the other thing we're super proud of, and it's happening in all three schools, is the uh, using the district offered and in-house professional development time to focus on different themes. And this year at the Bachelor School, we were using universal design for learning and social emotional learning. Both came under larger umbrellas of district um, professional development opportunities and teacher leadership getting involved in those. So the UDL had the mentors where teachers attended training over the summer. They came back, did work, um, and then in, over the course of the year they ran a book group. Um, and today it actually culminated today at our faculty meeting where they were offering five mini PD sessions for teachers who had choices to, they had to go see three of them. So they got to select which three to go to just this afternoon. And then social emotional learning, um, you're hearing a lot about um, anxiety in the classroom, um, being mindful how to find a better balance in our classrooms. Um, and those are becoming more talked about and part of the curriculum in our schools. We're spending a lot of time, especially with the new accountability guidelines, as Dr. McKay referred to earlier. Um, we're, we've spent a lot of time this past year, and I imagine we'll commit the same amount of time next year to better um, familiarize ourselves with the new accountability system from the state with another round of data to understand what we're doing well, um, what changes they have made with their expectations, and what adjustments we need to make in our practice to continue to excel. Um, the nice part of the flow is using the data that we have available within our schools and what we're using for common assessments at the three elementary schools, um, which, and it usually is vertically aligned. So our teachers and our grade levels have team time to look at that data and compare it against the other outside data to make sure it all is telling the same story. Um, we also are able to use that information to create school goals, student learning goals for educators, professional practice goals, including progress monitoring, not just saying we want to do something. How do we know from September to June that we're doing it, doing it well, and it's making a difference for our students? Uh, school safety and, and student wellness, obviously with the social emotional learning, 
We've done a lot of work with the ALICE protocols and other uh, school safety measures. Um, we've increased and enhanced the school video ver surveillance of the perimeter and access points of the bachelor school, added two AED devices, three stop the bleed kits to improve access throughout the building in case of an emergency, and then also improved our walkie-talkie capabilities for our school's incident management team to make sure we're able to communicate through the building, which is sometimes hard in our school because we're four floors with a lot of steel and concrete. Um, teaching and learning, it's the same. These numbers are, are great, like as far as well, we try to figure it out. Because all of our students across all three schools perform very well on the, on the state assessments, that 25% increase isn't, it's about moving the kids out of the, the partially or not meeting it, but it's also keeping the students who are in the meeting accept, um, expectations. And that sometimes is even more challenging because with the state assessments, one question can be the difference of that cut. So it's a lot of work in doing that. Uh, so we review data, we drill down to individual students within subgroups. You heard Dr. McKay talk about high needs. You're talking about all your different subgroups. So you have to have an understanding of what those are because when you're looking to make 25%, sometimes in, in these cases, that might be six or eight students. So you really kind of have to start to understand what your groups look like at each grade level. Uh, Mrs. Molly mentioned the empowering writers, focus on narrative writing for 2018-19. We still used a, our co-teaching model to enhance literacy and math instruction. And then we're really starting to define more what our tiered instruction would look like at the bachelor school and trying to combine that with what our instructional support team practices are which is also part of the pre-referral process for special education at the bachelor school. Management and operations, um, the incident management team we talk about, that's something that you know is really becoming pretty regular um, and responsible as far as making sure people feel as best prepared as they can in the case of an emergency. Um, we want to continue to focus on our students' level of engagement what they want to know um, and how they like to learn. Work with student leaders. Uh, we are the one school right now that doesn't have an active um, student council. We're hoping to get that into play during the next school year and use them to help us with some of the way we communicate our expectations and how to improve self-regulation and self-monitoring. And then one of the ones that we, we're going to um, work on next year, too, is in our, one of our areas is just working on the quality of the air in the hot months, September especially, not so much in June, but in September in the older buildings. So we're looking at window repairs, um, adding additional fans, or maybe even in a more of a budget long term would be some sort of um, air conditioning consideration. Family community engagement, we're gonna create an attendance team to work directly with students and families to address chronic absenteeism and other attendance issues in school. Uh, it's not a huge problem at the bachelor school, as I imagine it's probably not in the North Reading Public Schools, but it is a layer of accountability for uh, the state of Massachusetts. So starting to understand what that means, what that looks like, and how we engage families to talk about um, patterns and issues that we're having um, and then to document those because from 5 to 18 that's a long journey um, so that's something we're pretty excited about um, and it's nice because it's not overwhelming it's like I said it's not a huge problem um, increased parent community involvement in day-to-day -day school operations through digital learning student support supervision support mentoring and tutoring we've tried a couple of different things at the school level um, to get parents in to work with students, to help us run activities, and that we do a news broadcast at the school, and we have parent volunteers that completely own different parts of that, um, so they work directly with the students. So it's a lot of things that we're excited about that we're bringing resources in that are available to us to work directly with students. Um, and then also, in return, trying to get our faculty, staff, and administration to be more involved. Um, I like the idea of the school council um, speaker series. Like, you know, that's something we should actually talk about doing a couple together, you know, as all three schools and bringing all those uh, groups together um, and different ideas of going to BPO to try to increase attendance, 
um, school council, different things like that. And then in professional culture, very similar to some of the things that uh, we heard. We're really focusing on making sure that we're identifying professional practice and student learning goals that really uh, measure what we're trying to do with our co-teaching um, and then our instructional support where we're doing a little bit of staff adjust to kind of help us with some of that tiered instruction. So I want to make sure we're getting the results back to make sure it's a good use of resources. Um, our educator evaluation with the changes, it's a lot of time and work, but trying to create a lot of dialogue with faculty and staff about that so it's as effective as possible. Uh, I love the faculty and staff at the end of the year to tell us about what PD things they wanna do for the next year. So instead of me just thinking about what I think would be appropriate to bring, use the information they have and think about how we can bring that to them. We find that to get a very good response. And that was the interventions, and that's it. Wow, speed. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay, thank you very much, Mr. Colleen, Dr. McKay, Mrs. Molly. I'm sure a lot of people have questions they've been dying to ask, so. <laughs> I know uh, any of the. This is, well, the first Perhaps. Why is that? So we're trying to make sure we're not doing that right now. So we have Mrs. Molly the representative. She's apparently in a big rush to get home. There you go. For, for those of us who'll be here quite a while longer, we're less than sympathetic. Yes. <laughs> okay. So open um, it up. Who has I have a question for all three principals, you all spoke um, about the social emotional learning. Um, I would say 10 years ago, you probably didn't hear all that much about it. And it seems that it's been getting more um, aware. And it's started from like high school and now it's kind of in middle school. When did you start seeing it in the elementary? Has it been there all the time and we just didn't see it or didn't kind of talk about it? You mean as far as the anxiety piece? Yeah. I, I think it's always, I actually, I think it's always been part of the elementary school. Oh, okay. It's been embedded in the curriculum. We've had the open circle mm -hmm. training, you know, years and years ago. Um, I, th I believe that a lot of the data they're getting from their older students is why it's becoming um, such a, a big deal in education. So w in the PD that we've attended, a lot of the best practices are things that are pretty common in the elementary school. Our focus is really trying to make sure we're using the same vocabulary, uh, trying to be consistent by grade levels and what offerings and things we're doing to help. Um, so I actually think we're in a pretty good place as far as social emotional learning in the elementary school. But with the accountability and the expectations coming in, it, it's, it's time worth while and well spent. And um, for you, uh, Dr. McKay, you had mentioned that you did uh, the climate survey. Now, did it, was that just the hood, or so, did all elementaries do that? Yeah, I, I was gonna say, I think I can speak to Sean and Chris. I think that we're on alternating patterns around that. I know, I know Sean did a comprehensive one two years ago, and I believe you did last year and now. So I'm like, I'm probably one every two years or every three years, depending on how long the evaluation cycle of the actual data that we collect is. So I think that I think we've all recognized that in order to improve student learning, the school culture plays a big part in that, and the feelings of the adults in the building and the way the adults work together. So how do you improve student outcomes or the learning environment for all through analysis of data? Okay, yeah. all right, thank you. Rich? Um, <clears throat> You all talked about universal design for, for learning, and as I remember, that involves um, allowing flexibility in your in your in spaces so that students who might have um, who might benefit from being in a different physical, different desk situation or chair situation. Am I remembering correctly? That's basically what it is. So I, I'm curious where that dis where that discussion over the last year has sort of led you all. Um, in terms of practice and, and, and what you oh, think I mean, going, looking forward. And 
we've been fortunate to have a lot of trainings on things and, 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 and just using a different lens to really look at students as individuals and, and how they present. Um, I don't know, I we really haven't checked in across the three of us on that. I mean, I can tell you that we went off on a little bit of a, a left at my school with um, <laughs> flexible seating. Mm -hmm. And we've spent right. a lot of time talking about that and accessing through feeling comfortable in a classroom. And you know, we go from chairs with elastic bands mm -hmm. on them to to squishy chairs to yoga balls to stand up desks and now stand up computer tables and those kind of things. So it's like implementing it that way and kind of looking at how to make each kid feel comfortable and access the curriculum through being comfortable in the classroom for us. I think it's more about. Getting to know your kids and, and, and planning for what they need, not reacting after you, you know after you've had them for a while. Planning is a huge piece of it, um, and giving kids a voice and some choice in their learning is important. Um, so I think those are the, some of the things that we're we're looking at. Just say quickly, we had a um, a model this year. We'd love to have a, a person in district to be this coach. We can't. Uh, financially do that so we're sharing that coach with multiple districts in the same collaborative that coach came in and worked with two people in every building mm -hmm. folks did fantastic it was very well received as a model and so each of these schools has two teachers that are sort of a train the trainer they've been trained they've done stuff uh, we had the person there intensively for one week each year and that's going to continue next year and then we're also going to have um, those mentors continue in each building so that's all of that learning and that embedded PD is going to continue Chris? Yeah, Dr. McKay, I've got a question for you. Um, you seem very humble in how you put it. The, uh, the Hood School had this fantastic success this year with the science testing. Um, and as I was looking over that and thinking about it, I was curious, from your perspective, um, can you put your finger on what went right? What, what led to such great success? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think we're fortunate we all did fairly well, right, when you talk about, what, 847 elementary schools and, and how we all performed. Yep. Absolutely. That. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, we were definitely excited. I think that it was the right group of kids, the right group of time with the right teacher. And mm -hmm. I think that we've described it as at the Hood School, when we had one of our, S, I mean, our school-wide days, is, you know what, each teacher has done a great job owning their responsibility around each part of the curriculum, all the way from your kindergarten classroom, all the way up to fifth grade, and, and, and we, have, we have an ace in fifth grade teaching science as a unit, just one teacher, and she, she finished it off and hit a home run with it in that group of kids. So, you know, it was many things, um, you know, great curriculum, great teacher, great kids, and a great six-year implementation of a, you know, pretty solid program. So we're pretty happy about it. Uh, you know, we look at that, that number one kind of thing, and you always say, well, where do you land next year? You know, it's, it's hard to, <laughs> hard to. Just ask the Red Sox. Yeah. 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 Well, I, 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 would, I was going to say, one of the things I noticed in, in Mr. Clean's um, presentation, I assume that's true of all of you, is that even with the great results, you, you dig through the data and you find opportunities, uh, which is a, a great use of data when, especially when you, the high, the high level numbers say you're doing so well, there are always opportunities buried there somewhere, right? So. Uh, that is a, a, a way to, to keep those numbers as high as you can. Right. Chris, other questions? Uh, yeah, you know, I had one other question for, uh, for all of you guys. Uh, I saw a couple times in the presentations uh, making as a point of focus giving faculty opportunities to peer, not peer review, but peer observe and, and kind of learn from each other. Um, and all three schools have very oh, uh, uh, a high percentage of overlapping goals. I'm curious if you guys had the opportunity to see amongst each other, amongst the three of you, what you know each of you does and kind of steal from the best. It's, um, you know, it, it we have. He was my mentor when I started, so I we, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we, it, it's it's even super hard to sometimes offer as much as we do within our own buildings. That being said, um, I know that my school psychologist is a first year professional and as part of her professional practice goal, we decided that it was essential that she got into other buildings to see people in job alike categories. Um, 
in I have had special ed um, teachers request to go over and see other teachers and programs <coughs> to see how, and that's been well received. There probably is room for us to do more um, because so many of our teachers work together in um, leadership capacities through the district and curriculum specialists and things like that to do that. The hardest part is as soon as you send somebody out of the building, you lose your half hour peer observation now becomes an hour um, in, in trying to figure that out. Sure. I, I'm just wondering if you get to observe the other principals in the district. Oh, to, us? To, yeah. It's not we, quite we as a but. We do have but, secret meetings. <laughs> oh, I see. We spend a lot, I'm trying to we find spend out a lot of time are. together. Don't tell me. <laughs> we just don't tell anybody the date yeah. all the time yeah. because then they take the date the time away from us. <laughs> She hijacked yeah, everything. Yeah, she's, yeah. she's we do, good. We do get together quite often. And, 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 uh, and when it comes to writing the goals, we're looking at a lot of things to sure. share our time and resources to help each other be as successful as possible. I, th I think when I, when I spoke early on, it's like, yeah, we have the same goals, and we each have a little different flair to it, but it's all the same outcome goal at the end, and how we calibrate with each other is important around that, just to ensure that experience is fairly consistent across the three. So. When they get to that middle school, it's, there's, a, there's a very similar baseline mm -hmm. upon arrival. Sure. Thank you. Patrick's good work, yes. Mrs. Batwell. Mm -hmm. No, I think that what I find so fascinating about the social and emotional learning programs is how do you measure that at the end of the day? It's always, you know, something that is on there as a school improvement and something that's been tackled. Um, but it must be really difficult to say this program's working much more effectively <laughs> than this tactic or this strategy. Um, and do you just foresee this, you know, constantly evolving? And what do you stick with versus not? Is there a way that you take a pulse check on that? Well, I think so much social emotional learning is already happening in our schools. Mm -hmm. When we started to learn about it and really do some reading and read books on it, it was so clear that things that we're recommending be implemented in the school are already happening. Mm -hmm. I think it is hard to measure, but one of, to me, when you have happy kids mm -hmm. who want to be at school, mm -hmm. who enjoy being there, when their parents comment that they're happy being at school and they, they, they don't want to stay home, right. um, when you see you know, fewer and fewer cases of kids having anxiety, mm -hmm. uh, those are the kinds of things, that's the way I think you have to measure overall versus like program versus program. Yeah. yeah. And we don't have, like Open Circle is just one tool that we use, mm -hmm. but we do so much more than, than just that. Yeah. It's a theme, but it's tough to know the details. Yeah. And it should be permeating everything we do. Right. And it's, it starts as simple as, you know, we started this year making sure that every teacher was at the door when, they, when the children came in each child yeah. Yeah. using their name in the morning. Yeah. And that makes a difference to some kids. <coughs> makes them feel cared about. Well, Mr. Bernard, go ahead. I, I just, I'm glad Mr. Papavasilio called out um, some of the performance statistics at the Hood School. Um, I, I, like all of you, am very proud of all of the work that goes on in all of our schools. And, and with the three elementary school principals here, um, Acknowledge that on Friday, um, Mrs. Marley, <coughs> Mr. Colleen, Dr. Daly, and I, and I think a couple of teachers will be traveling into Boston at the State House to um, um, receive the accolade of, a sc of schools of recognition um, that I've, sh I've shared with you earlier in the year of, the, of that notification. But Friday is the day when we'll be traveling into the State House. Um, and I think it's important for you to know that among the 51 different schools um, that will be um, honored, North Reading is uh, one of only a handful of communities that has more than one school in its district being recognized. <coughs> I think that speaks very well, um, God bless you, Michael, for, for the district. Um, it just happens to be their turn this year, but all of our schools in some way, shape, or form over the years have received a, a, you know, a call out uh, of sorts um, at either the state or national level, and it's just, I think, something that, that the whole community can find as a great, a great source of pride. Thank you. And so I mean, I have, a, I have one or two specific questions and a couple of overarching comments, but just beginning with a comment, and when Mr. Bernard's leaving now, we're really looking a lot at like what makes a good leader, and I think we are so 
fortunate to have you know the principals that we have in this district I mean I think the elementary school principals are all very different we we visit each school I appreciate that none of you tried to make us look dumb this year because we usually can't answer you know we're not smarter than a fifth grader <laughs> but we we appreciate that but just going and like we, you're just seeing stand-up desks like Mr. Webster took an hour. He was fascinated with a stand-up desk. He probably bought one when he went home. And so it's just like, you know, the maker space. Just seeing what people are doing, it's really nice. And it's good that it's not a cookie cutter. It's not everybody's replicating each other, that you are, even when you're standing up here, you're saying, well, that's a good idea. I'm going to steal that for next year. So, I mean, I think we appreciate that. It's, it's hard to lose a superintendent, but it's really good when you have a great administrative staff here in general. And, you know, again, I mean, you, you probably – help him look good and he helps you guys look good and it's it's at the end of the day the what benefits is North Reading and so you know we're very fortunate to have all of you here um, you know doing what you guys do um, accountability standards I think Mr. Clean touched on it a little bit I mean it's great that we're every school's award-winning at every two or three years it seems like but it's just we're a good district. I mean, it's so hard to make improvements when all you're looking on is, you know, you had three students that, you know, weren't, weren't doing well. And so if one of them does better the next year, now, now we get an award. And it's just, it's, it's a little bit silly, but at the end of the day, it is what it is. The fact is our school's doing really, really well, all of them. And I mean, it, it, I, I think it's funny when I look at real estate listings and, you know, last year you started seeing, oh, this is in the hood district, which is you know, world renowned. And this year I just saw something the other day and, you know, the award winning little school district and, yeah. you know, the desirable bachelor district. And it, it just, it, it rotates from year to year. But overall, I mean, all three schools are doing great. Um, you know, I appreciate that. My one question that I'm going to pull out of this is actually from Mr. Colleen. I think on page 18 of your uh, presentation, <laughs> You talked about homework policy being revised after some um, discussion, and so I'm just curious a little bit about what what the revisions are, what the what the commentary about the homework policy that you heard was. So when we when we review our policy as a as a faculty, we are looking at how it is scaffolded from grade level to grade level, and then we also try to look because even within grade levels, you have four classroom teachers who might have a slightly different homework philosophy. So we try to make sure the puzzle fits, like as far as just the logic, the scope, the sequence, and how much we're doing, um, how much value are we getting back from it. That's the bigger conversation um, that we're just starting to scratch the surface on. Okay. I mean, there, there's been other presentations that have come before us talking about homework and time. So I'm just curious what's going on at the elementary as yeah. well with that. So thank you. You're welcome. Any so other I, comments, questions? If I could just uh, add on to what you were saying about, about the, the recognition and, the, and the, how the data is supporting that. And, and, and we talk about the three students or, or whatever it is. I, at, while at the same, it can be frustrating knowing that those numbers sort of rely on those students but how it, it for me it seems very rewarding to be able to recognize to be able to see the students that need that help and be able to to help lift them as well i think i think even looking at the your abs, your absent your absenteeism team if that's what you're calling it you're right it's not a chronic problem in the bachelor or at north or in north reading but that may help you identify three kids who mm -hmm. uh, who need that attention and just and where that a little bit of attention might go a really long way so um as beholden as we seem to be to those numbers at least there's real information underneath them that is useful uh, for the students so okay thank you everyone yeah thanks thank okay. you like to say the thank kids you. come to us from great Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I, I glanced over when I looked at Chris and saw this big wrench in the corner. 
I have a feeling oh, it has that something. That's mine, actually. I had, I had a feeling it has something to do with Mr. Hardiker. It might have there, something to do with Mr. Hardiker. I know. Uh, Mr. Mr. Hardiker, would you like to come up and or from there present on the okay right here with a, your <coughs> annual report on the school building? Uh, Wayne Hardiker, facilities director. Um, I've been here almost 20 years. At the end of this month, it will be 20 years. Uh, the job is uh, dynamic and challenging. Um, what I've noticed over the course of my tenure is technology is rocketing along from those white light, little green lights on those light switches, they're all programmed. You can't just go and make a change. If you want to make a change, you've got to plug in a laptop. Um, technology is rocketed along. And part of my challenge is keeping up with it. Um, I want to thank John Bernard and Mike Conley for their support for the facilities department. Um, how much has changed over the time? And operational cost, uh, their support, um, especially this year. I see some pluses here and there, which has really been quite exciting for me, um, uh, recognizing what it really takes to operate this beautiful facility. Um, as far as that wrench right there, uh, back when Mel Webster was on the school committee, you'd always ask me to bring some show and tell, and I would. I'd bring an air quality measuring device or something. This year, I figured I'd change a little bit. Now, Mr. Bernard accepted a donation of an eight-inch pipe wrench, uh, Mr. Bowers. Cliff Bowers is on the school committee and the building committee. And it, it, that weighs like 60 pounds. Oh, yeah. I won't go pick it up then. <laughs> <laughs> I brought it in on a two-wheeler. And actually, I've got his little brother right here. <laughs> this is, this, they're both actual tools for tradesmen, but uh, um, that one is for. Now, that, that was an anonymous donation, but since you revealed the donor. Oh, was it anonymous? I'm gonna yes, that's OK. <laughs> I'm going to tell you that I promised Cliff that if we ever had to use that wrench, I was going to take a picture of it being used because I said we're going to have a major problem if that if that wrench needs to be used somewhere in the building. It weighs 60 pounds. It was a nice donation. Uh, as far as staffing, we have 18 custodians system wide, um, 15 custodians in the schools, um, two grounds maintenance staff, and one 7D driver. <clears throat> this school has eight custodians, uh, three in a first shift and five on the second shift. Unfortunately, two of those gentlemen are floaters, so there are times where they could be sent to another school to fill in for any number of reasons, and it saves money, but it also takes away from the workload here. The average workload at this school is of 270,000 square feet is about 33,000 square feet per person per day. Industry averages are around 28 to 32,000 square feet per person per day. So we're kind of pushing the envelope. The bottom line is, from my regard, and I think other people's regard, that the school looks great. You walk in this place, it sparkles, it glows, it, it smells good, it's fresh. Um, we've, got a good, we've got a good staff. We've got a good hard-working staff. Um, some additional requests for staffing would be, like an additional floater would be nice. Um, I've asked for some help for me from a technological standpoint, technology standpoint, with only everything being computer driven and computer based these days. Um, my desire is to have another, like an assistant. Uh, my thought was to have like assistant director and then if there's any good or she any good, they take my seat. But you know, there is a need there. Technology has really advanced over the years, uh, and I'll list a few things that have, that have really challenged us. From a, a Builders and Grounds standpoint, we have a Maya Rewards Program. Um, we've received over $29,000 in grants for any number, any number of things. But I want to list today's grant which was $4,200 for infrared scan of the Hood School roof. And I'd like to, if you want to take a look at this, this is a scan of the Hood School roof. And that roof is, was put on in 1999. The DI walked in the door, was put on. To, it's a Sarnafil single-ply roof. Um, $4,200 well invested. Uh, how they do an IR scan is that they'll do it at night if the sun warms up, will warm up a roof, any areas that stay warm because there's moisture there will show up. Um, we're, in, we're in pretty good shape. It's for a 20-year-old roof, we've, we've maintained it well. There's a couple of spots that are damp, but 
Not, nothing really of grave concern. It, it is in our capital needs rep uh, list for replacement as being a 20-year-old roof, but you know, it's pretty good, so. We've done well with uh, Meyer Grants. Uh, as Mr. Bernard mentioned, we, we got a grant, security grant from the state for $175,000, well applied, I think. Um, as Ms. Molly mentioned about all, all elementary classroom doors can be locked from the inside without going outside. That's a major improvement. That was, a, that was quite, a, quite a challenge. A lot of doors, different doors, different mechanisms. We'll take additional security cameras at the elementaries. Um, we several, several new doors, high security doors, uh, exterior doors, uh, a new access device with Mr. Sub Bernard's support, and this, an access a fob device. You know, that's pretty good. Uh, what else have I got? Um, Breaking it down per school, um, the little school, which, has a, which is now in its third year, it's called an SBS roof, and it stands for styrene, butadiene, and styrene. It's it's a it's a it's a membrane. Um, we, we 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 did probably 80 percent of the little school roof, and it's in its third year. It's in it's in terrific shape. The little school has what they call lock and bar boilers. They're extremely efficient. There's three units. Each one has two boilers in it. I can fine tune them on my computer. Uh, if Mrs. Molly's, <laughs> it's cold or something, but um, they're very efficient. Um, if it's a real cold day, they'll all ramp up. I'm going to watch my computer. They'll ramp up quickly, and as the temperature gets up to operating to comfort levels, they'll start to ramp down, and, and maybe just one is operating and on, on the coldest days. They're really, they're quite impressive. It, 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 in conjunction with that, I'm available for tours. I love to show people around uh, from the boiler rooms to the roof. On this roof in particular, there are 19, they look like freight cars up there. They all, and they, there's one that controls this atmosphere right here. If you, if you look on the floor, you'll see outlets on the floor, and all the heating and cooling comes out of the floor. It, it goes up through and it goes up to the roof. And everything's up on the roof. Part of the design of this school is displaced, called displacement ventilation. It had to convince a lot of us on the building committee, what does that mean? What it means is that there's no unit vents in the classroom. Now, if you go on all our elementaries, you'll see a unit vent on the wall. It makes noise. It can be noisy. It brings in air. And this, this, everything's up on the roof. Now, pl the plus of that, that, they're quiet. There's no classrooms. They're very quiet. The challenge is that everything's up there. If something breaks down or something, right now we're in the process of replacing all the filters up there. There's two inch and four inch filters. And a myriad of belts. There's a thousand filters that have to be replaced up there. Take them down, bring up new ones, twice, at least twice a year. In the high pollen season, like now, and they're going on now, replacing all the belts. You get down to my, my area downstairs, you'll see a lot of stuff down there. It's belts and filters and all kinds of, all kinds of cool stuff. In two schools, we still have asbestos, two schools. The little and the hood have asbestos floor tile. Um, it's almost like a career challenge to get rid of it all. It's all gone from the batch. We used to have some in the middle school and the old high school. It's all gone now. Um, it's very complicated and labor intensive and expensive to remove it. Um, but it's all in good shape. We, we are under a HERA restrictions, regulations, which is state. And we're all up to date on that, so it's safe, but we want to remove it. And that's a, it's, it's quite a challenge. New gym floor at the little school. I'm, Chris did mention new gym floor. New Elastic, Elastic Plus gym floor. Uh, synthetic, like the hood and the, and the bachelor have the same type floor. They're really sharp. Uh, long time coming at the little school. Um, found the money on the capital. Uh, but it, it's really sharp. You take a look at it. It's beautiful. It is beautiful. The bachelor's in its 13th year of operation, which is hard to imagine. Uh, it was renovated in 2006, rebuilt in 04 and 05. And as it, if you know this, but two years we took the entire operation to Stoneham, which is pretty impressive. And one thing that I remember well, Stoneham had a no school day, and we had school at Stoneham. It was pretty cool. I sent our guys down to plow them out. 
Um, this school, 270,000 square feet. Oh, the high school, this portion opened in 2014. Middle, the middle school opened in 2015. Um, the heating, come on down, take a look. Three, four million BTU boilers and two 300 ton chillers. Now when the chillers start, they're operating right now, up the line here, they, they sound like jet engines, but they're really pretty impressive, so I'm always available for tours. <laughs> uh, we have service agreements with several companies now, and it's all techno technology related. The Daikin company, which I just got another quote for some stuff, I just gave it to my boss, um, some maintenance items. They, they service all the, and they're doing all the filters now, up on the roof, the belts, and they service the chillers. Um, we have a company that automated logic, which helps us manage all the computer controlled heating cooling. I'd love to show it to you. It's very impressive. You, you show this, you can, you can see a screen, all the motors are running and the temperatures, the humidities, and it is pretty, it is pretty impressive. But they help us and update it and keep it operational. So then it drifts off a little bit, they help us bring it back, so. We have a company that helps us manage the lighting, um, all computer based. Uh, more laptops and we had an issue with one classroom, couldn't figure it out. The laptop, the programming, the teacher was in there and the lights came back on. So, And BCM controls, which manages all of our security systems. Um, there are a lot of them. Um, FOBs, entry, entry devices, um, any number of things that, for security. Um, we team up with the RMLD, light department, uh, for demand shedding. You know, I'll get a directive, say in a hot, a really hot day, a really cold day, if we can shed any power, it'll cut our demand, it'll, say, it'll save us some money. So it, it's pretty effective. But, uh, finally, and if you have any questions, please ask. And no one ever asks any questions for me. My big four, and it's been like this, and I'm like a broken record, Mr. Bernard Smelling, my big four, and it, and it doesn't change. As much, as much as technology advances, my big four are, oh, 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 oh. it was a prompt. Oh, oh. <laughs> clean, clean, safe, warm, and dry. Clean is clean. Technology is great, but clean is clean. Safe. Now, we do a lot of things for safety around here. The warm part, or cooling, you know, you're either warm or you're cold, believe me. There's 400 staff in here, in here, and I hear about it. Mostly it's pretty good. In the dry part, you know, the roof's not leaking. And just that, that, that skin you just, you just saw there, not, uh, so my big four don't change. And I know I'm like a broken record. I sometimes go to town, wherever I go, yeah, Wayne, we, we suck, we're sick of hearing about it. But uh, that, that's kind of that's where we are. That's kind of where we are, so questions? Thank you very much, Wayne. So comments, questions? Uh, yeah, I've got one for you. Um, I see that in the hood and the little, um, there is a consideration for upgrading to LED lighting. Uh, how long of a time does it take for that to earn back in savings, what it costs in it's, replacement? It's pretty fast. We looked into doing the entire little school, but kind of cost prohibitive. Um, um, payback three to five years, but the whole, to the whole school, I forget what it costs. It was a lot. So the, the little school, we had a proposal to um, outfit the entire little school, and it was through the, the capital plan, our capital plan through the CIPC, <coughs> and um, a company would, would come in and sort of outfit the entire school and, and make sure you're getting uh, the, the, the biggest rebates and the right structures are being um, installed and so right. forth to generate the highest level of rebates. And it was about given... Um, the size of the school, the age of the school, and so forth, it was going to be about a, about a six-year payback. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the cost to do the entire school was uh, a little more than $200,000. Um, we initially were looking for about 50000 through the request to get started, which would have been, we would have had to do more of like a phase-in approach. We would have focused on the larger common areas. Mm -hmm. Uh, initially, um, the gymnasiums, the, the um, cafeterias, library, and so forth, and um, you know that obviously that payback got stretched out. But we we had a couple of different scenarios that we were running by the capital planning committee, and you know, unfortunately that project in particular, though they were impressed with the payback, um, 
you know, got weighted down a little bit, you know, with below, below the, the, the funding level. But we'll continue to look at it and explore it because it, it is, there is savings there and it is worthwhile investment. Um, and we, we sort of like, we, we, we have kind of played around through, through Wayne and our local electrician and our contractor kind of doing it kind of as we go. And we've purchased some LEDs on our own and we are doing that. But, uh, you know, the, the approach to kind of once to kind of outfit all and, and move move forward to, to get an entire school or an entire section of the school, at least in a wing of a school, outfitted at once seems to be worthwhile given the savings. The, sa the savings are real. So I think this, this school, we missed the LED cutoff probably by about a year. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It was designed with, it's not LED. Mm -hmm. you know, we, we've replaced several, we've, we've, we've got tubes to replace, tube for tube, but uh, there's thousands of tubes in here. It's, plus, these these other these, you know these, these little guys are uh, challenging too. But there are thousands of bulbs here, thousands. Um, but it's in it's in it's in the works, sure. long term, short term. But it's in the works. So. Yeah. Rich, do you have something? Uh, oh, I probably did, but I forgot, forgot it. <laughs> <laughs> Janine. Um, Wayne. Um, Sean Clean had mentioned that on the fourth floor, it's really warm during the summer. When the school was built, refresh my memory, did they have air conditioning? The bachelor? Yeah. That was built in 1920. Yeah, that, well, that I meant... That section. The, that section. Yeah. Oh, okay. So the, it's talking about the old, it's old the thing. the old, the original. Okay. Yeah. It's, 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 I was going to say... It's can, entrance on Peabody thing. Street? Yeah. That wing up there? Yeah. The top I believe one? that they've been getting ceiling fans donated, if I'm not mistaken, Wayne. Isn't that right? As part of a uh, uh, parent organization? I think they're looking to enhance that further, and he's also talked about... Some, some window units for us, but it's an expense. That was it. All right. Mr. Um, my, my only other comment quick is just I think, yes, the schools look great when I walk, walk in, but more than that, like every custodian I've ever run into is just polite and friendly and appropriate. And again, I think that's very important as well, where, you know, they, they are representative of our schools as well. And so I think. You know your staff is you know very professional whenever I've ever run into them, and so good, good, I appreciate great. that as well. So. You do a good job. Yes, yes. and I, 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 and I would the one th I did think of. Uh, <laughs> I think I think the committee in general agrees with you on on the floating positions because we were trying to get those mm -hmm. this year, um, and hopefully it'll it'll uh, show up yeah. as a as a as a item for next year. But uh, so we we totally, I think we all understand and, and see that value as well. So uh, hopefully that's something we can do. Okay. Thank you very much. Just had a comment. We keep oh, beating yes. the drum. Uh, uh, you, no, yes, Ms. what Mr. McGowan just said is a good segue. I mean, we, our our facility staff, and I appreciate the positive comments of the committee to Wayne. Um, they are a good group of people. They work very hard. They 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 are asked to do sometimes you know very thankless work, and they do it professionally and and with pride, and and that. That's true for Wayne, too. He takes an awful lot of pride in his work. His job is not easy. Their job is not easy. We have very high expectations here um, of every department in the school district, and, and that includes facilities, buildings, and grounds. And um, you know, Michael, Michael works very closely with Wayne, um, contributes an awful lot to um, the work that needs to get done um, uh, along with Wayne, uh, and there is a lot. The, the, the sophistication of this building in particular, but all of our schools have advanced a lot in terms of their, their, their kind of their mechanical operations, and um, it, it is not something that you can just learn overnight. It has required a lot of extra time and a lot of extra effort, and I think um, one of the things that, that when I leave North Reading that I'll be most proud of is the fact that people have come here and, and, and kind of made the commitment to do the work and do it well. So. Um, Wayne, thank you for tonight, but thank you also for all that you do do um, for the school district and, and your and your staff as well. He is holding it, holding it, holding us to high standards. And, and, and I get a lot of texts and Mr. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 just from that's a that's a that's a positive because it yeah. it keeps us all on the same level and it, 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 the excellence here is it, it just it's it's for me it's just phenomenal you know mm -hmm. the, the, the 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 level is up to here in all departments you know and, and even if i even if you only get four or five texts a day it's not bad so. <laughs> I, I i just keep thinking my kids can't keep a 150 square foot room clean <laughs> your, your kids are your your people are cleaning 33,000 square feet a day pretty each much, yeah. pretty much, pretty much. Okay, thank you so much. Thank Wayne. you very much. Thanks a lot. Okay, moving on. Looks like we have some parents for 
possibly school start times. Dr. Daly. Okay. I will get lost then. Thank you. I passed the matzo yeah, just for the committee. All right, folks, welcome. Thank you, everyone, and thank you to our School Start Times Advisory Committee who's here as well. I know that the puck dropped about 10 minutes ago, so people are thinking about that, right? So we didn't know that when we've planned this in advance. It's a good problem to have, right, that the Bruins are in the cup. I want to thank our committee. Many of uh, the folks are here with us tonight. Um, Alyssa Fishman, Sean Colleen, Rich McGowan, who's school committee. Uh, David Miller, Samantha Miller, who are not related, we found out. Uh, <laughs> Nicole Pierce, uh, our teacher representative. Carrie Reddington, uh, Sheila C. Thurman, and Debbie Sharp. So we just want to start off with a brief uh, history. So in, some of us might be aware, in 2006, the school committee formed a subcommittee to study in greater detail the concept of changing start times. Um, they shared some of the research about about sleep and some of the reasons for change. And this was really ahead of the curve. Some of the reasons why they did this in 2006 is the science was just emerging and a lot of folks were talking about it. And with the Batchelder School coming back, uh, what uh, Mr. Hardaker was just talking about, coming back from Stoneham, this seemed like an opportune time to discuss the possibility. So at the end of that um, presentation, they shared four options. Um, one was to move secondary start times only. Another was to move all start times for 15 or 30 minutes. Another was to flip the elementary and secondary start times. And then they discussed some of the pros and cons for each option. So that group was a little bit in a different place than where we are tonight. So we're going to bring you through where we are tonight. We're not leaving tonight uh, with making recommendations for change. We're basically explaining what our group did this year, and, and really our ask is going to be to continue this work and to do some further study in the future in greater detail. So the current group, we formed a exploratory committee back in 2016. This was a charge that came out of the school committee and uh, Mr. Bernard that explored. He was working with the Cape Ann League superintendents and brought those folks together. The Middlesex League had come together and signed a pact to explore this in greater detail. And you'll see in a few slides that a lot of those Middlesex League districts have moved forward with this change. Um, at that time, we wrote some articles. We put a few releases out to get parents that were interested. We had only a handful of parents. Of, uh, I think it was two emails that I got at that time um, from folks that were interested. But one thing that we took from that as we formed, we funneled it through our pause committee and our wellness committee, and we issued a sleep and stress survey to all of our students. We got a lot of interesting results about their, their need for sleep and their overall stress and anxiety levels, and we channeled that into this Do One Thing campaign, which we um, used. That was for parents, teachers, coaches, students to think about one thing that they could do to make the students able to get to bed earlier, to have a little bit less uh, stress, and to get some more sleep. So that was where we've been for the last few years. Um, but this year, in the, in the early fall, a few of our parents, the, uh, David and Samantha, actually approached uh, Mr. Bernard, and we formed uh, a group and came back here to say we wanted to form a joint group. So we formed that again with parents, teachers, administration, this committee. And we've explored all of the possible research and also identified some of the hurdles. Because we said if we're going to move forward and get anything public with this, we want to make real clear that we've identified some of those hurdles up front. We also did a survey to our students this year through the uh, survey that, that uh, Amy Luckwood shared with the school committee. Those results are still uh, forthcoming. But we'll be very interested to see how some of our specific sleep uh, questions came uh, in the responses. So we wanted to prepare a few minutes here in this section where I really want to thank my committee for uh, the, the, the community parent side of this really did a lot of great um, compilation of the articles here. And we've shared all these with you. There's links there. So our goal tonight is obviously we're going to share a lot of information. I'm sure you're somewhat familiar with some of the research, but there's plenty of um, links and things for further exploration. And again, we were working on this, right? Uh, some of the changes are coming in today, actually. So um, we appreciate you, you minding uh, that, that we're giving this to you tonight. But we appreciate that you might want to explore it further. I'll be posting this online, so all those links will be live and active if folks want to explore as well. So we'll share that out. So some things happened, again, in the late 2000s, early part of this decade. 
Um, there were some national studies done. This really started to rise. Dr. Judith Owens, um, who is now the director of sleep medicine at Boston Children's Hospital, she was working nationally. Um, and this is a person who is local, who we may be able to come out and speak with us. She sp spoke in uh, Maskinam and a few other places as they were exploring as well. But you can see that what she's saying here in her quote is that, you know, this is a biological difference. Adolescents can't fall asleep much before 11. They're biologically programmed to wake up about 8. And if students' um, sleep patterns are in conflict with their natural circadian rhythms, then that, then that also has repercussions of cognitive function and emotional regulation, as well as potential health consequences. So it's widespread. This isn't just about students uh, nodding off during first period, which anyone who's taught um, adolescents at that age have, have noticed. It's about uh, much more wide-reaching wide possible um, issues. And we've carried some of that through here today. We've talked a lot about social-emotional learning. This is another thing that around this time there was so much focus from the national level from the state level on you know testing scores curriculum mandates the focus has shifted as we've seen for the last five or six years to really talking more about the whole child the health of the child the well-being the rise in anxiety levels and so you know just the keeping in mind all of these social and emotional concerns this is a very real thing that we can do to help students to think about um, the way that they're best equipped to manage their days so there's a lot of information here, but it's a great infographic about you know, some of the things that can happen with the science of sleep and the lack of sleep and what this causes, um, which causes our students to be affected. During puberty, adolescents become sleepy later at night and need to sleep later in the morning as a result of shifts in the biological rhythms. Many studies have found that 85% of students get less sleep than the recommended amount on a daily basis. And our studies, our local surveys, found similar kind of numbers with our students. So these are just a few of the things uh, kind of pulled out here, health, academics and school, society and community. You can see from our chart here um, some very serious things that can result from lack of sleep. It's, it's much more than just uh, nodding off in class, as you can see. Everything from um, you know, drug and alcohol use to executive functioning to uh, crime rates, risky behaviors academic test scores, athletic performance. So many, many areas that sleep really counts. So some of the recommendations here, the American a Academy of Pediatrics talks about a sleep time of no earlier, a start time of no earlier than 8.30 to enable students to get adequate sleep. So that's one of the considerations we've thought about here. You know, one argument is to say no change is the only thing that we should not do. We should do anything. But we do want to keep in mind that if we're going to make a lot of changes, especially if there's a financial impact, we want to make sure that it gets close to some of these recommended times. So again, nothing on the table right now for times, but these are, this is some of the data that's out there about what's recommended. It's just another quote from the Centers of Disease Control and some of the um, items that we highlighted earlier in the presentation as well. Very, some very serious side effects of sleeplessness. So some local districts that have made adjustments, Burlington, Melrose, Reading, very local to us. Lots of other districts in the Middlesex League, as you can see there. Um, I was on the way in, walked with a, a parent who's also a teacher in Stoneham who said this had some positive impacts in the, in the school community. So hearing from someone on both sides was great. Um, and John and I have a lot of colleagues in these districts, and we talk about this as well. We, we've shared a lot of information, and there's a lot to learn. So, and, and David was involved with the Burlington um, process as well, and that's part of how this came to us here. So there are, there are some blueprints, but again, everything is different. Every town is specific, and our goal here really with this group is to figure out what's right for North Reading and what next steps would be for North Reading. So these are some great resources that we've linked here for you. If you do want to read more and, and learn a little bit more, we thought these were some great inroads. The, still, the Massachusetts School Start Later Frequently Asked Questions, the CDC links, the National Sleep Foundation, and then also from the education perspective from the National Education Association on school start times. So just an update now on what we've done specifically in our group. So our group had seven parents, one of whom was also a, the teacher. She's a parent in town as well. We had two administrators, Mr. Clean and I, we on the group, and uh, Rich McGowan is the school committee representative. We met about nine times from the fall to present, but we corresponded many other times through email and through a lot of virtual work, building PowerPoints, building slides, 
Um, I'm very, very impressed with some of the work that our folks did on spreadsheets and shared. And uh, in Michael and, and John and I have shared, um, and we're very impressed with just the, the quality of the work that this group has done. To very serious analysis um, for an exploratory committee, and we're very thankful to you folks for that. Um, among those things that we, that we uh, worked on, um, we discussed the challenges and hurdles, which we're going to go into in greater detail, the best practices from other districts. Um, Rich made a great spreadsheet with some sliding start times. That was really pretty cool. If you could move things, you could see some of the, the slides. And Kerry uh, worked specifically on a, a bus um, schedule that was really presented us with some different options to consider for switching some start times. And that Michael then was able to look at as the Director of Finance and Operations to, to just give a quick analysis of if we went with option one, what, what might the cost be? Is this feasible? With option two, what were some of the costs and feasibility? So we did a very um, 30,000 foot sort of look at this idea, and we, we did find that it's certainly worth pursuing in greater detail. We communicated several times throughout the year. We've communicated articles in the superintendent's newsletter that we've shot out on Blackboard as well as are around the schoolyard articles in the newspaper, and also on Twitter and social media and other ways to share this out. We, s we sent a survey out, and 29 districts responded, which I thought was a great response. They talked about whether they were a district that changed their times, explored a change, no exploration and made no changes, and they shared their advice. They shared some templates, resources, and best practices. And we have some definite leads to follow up when we do want to survey the community. If we were to survey parents, students, um, if we wanted to develop some templates and some letters, lots of advice around you know considerations with, with various unions, considerations with busing, all those things. So lots of great work um, was collected and collated from that group as well. And we shared at Parent University. This is one of our first major acts. Um, they did have a very active social media group on Facebook, which, are, which is still active, which is great. But this was our first um, on, on campus activity. We had an information pavilion at P Parent University this year that, that our group staffed, which was, which was great. We got engaged in a lot of good conversations that way. So just to paint the picture, some of the hurdles and challenges that we've heard from other districts that we discussed in detail that we want to be able to address head on because we feel like if these are the questions we can identify, these are the questions we might hear from the community. And then the, it makes a lot of sense for us to have some good answers um, or, or at least show that we've been thoughtful about this. So. Obviously, athletics, arts, performing arts, robotics, other extracurricular activities. So if, if high school is starting later and now those events are starting later, how does that work? How do we schedule that with other districts? How does that work um, with the field, the stage availability with youth sports? So there's all sorts of complications there. And all of these ideas are not necessarily reasons not to do something, but they're absolutely things we need to consider and for us to recognize that there is going to be some work there and some challenge to overcome. But the, the question is always, what's best for kids? And if we can make these things work out, then we'll do what's best for kids. And that's why you know, we feel this might be worthy of further explanation, exploration. Um, coordination of events. We have four dismissal times for our buses in this district. And that is due to the, the size of the schools, the bus routes, and also um, just the number of buses that we have. If we, if we tried to limit uh, the number of dismissal times, it would require an increase in buses in, in some degree. So that's something that we're working within. Those are parameters we're still considering. Child care, the before and after school programs. We also have situations where high school students watch younger students, and those high school students need a motivation to get on the bus. So if they're starting later, maybe there's not someone there to motivate those older students to get on the bus. Obviously, the employee contracts, we think that there's definitely an impact to changing the start times and would be something that would need to be uh, discussed with all of our uh, employing groups, not just the teachers, but also paraprofessionals, cafeteria, custodians, all the groups um, would be impacted by a possible changes to start times. Certainly other costs that are out there, things that we've thought about, things that we may not have thought about. There may be busing, logistics, there may be uh, gains or losses to revenue based on after school, before school programs. So things to think about there. Possible challenges to the science itself. You might have people saying things like, well, won't the students just stay up later? Or will practices and rehearsals be scheduled before school? These are questions that other districts have wrestled with, and they're, they're valid questions, and they're questions that we would want to talk about. We certainly, in those frequently asked questions documents, a lot of these questions are answered, but they're good questions that we're going to certainly hear from the community, and questions that we've talked about as a committee as well. When you have any kind of change, there's always uh, concerns from the community. So I know some of our parents are involved specifically. They may have younger students and they really want to know what is the impact for elementary and middle school students. You know, we don't want to create the image of, 
you know, we're doing everything just for those teenagers that, that biologically need sleep. Meanwhile, the elementary students are now, you know, leaving for school much earlier, or it's, you know, maybe at a time that's not um, suitable or, or quite um, light or, or whatever the issues may be. So we want to be very careful how we frame change and make sure that we've thought things through and we're, we're being supportive of all students in the districts. And obviously, change for everyone's schedule, the drop-off times, the pick-up times, the uh, what impacts parents, teachers, educators, everyone. So it's very much um, a concern of ours that we want to be aware of, or just change itself. So our recommendations, so what we're asking for the community, uh, for, sorry, for the committee to consider. Um, we're hoping in 2019-20 that we continue to meet as an advisory subcommittee. We feel there's a lot of things to explore, and it makes sense to have um, a group that's representative of all stakeholders to continue to meet. But I think what might be different a little bit in 1920 is that as we explore this feasibility for changing start times, there would be a little bit more um, that would be coming from the superintendent to direct to some of the district admin administrators and the school administrators to work on. We would want to create some surveys to collect some data from our parents, students, from teachers and paraprofessionals, and also some other staff. We may want to get out in the community more and have some guest speakers and other presentations. As I mentioned, perhaps Dr. Owens could come out and just speak to the science of sleep um, and changing of school start times. That's something to get the community uh, involved and in more understanding of some of these scientific statistics. We may upgrade from just an information pavilion at Parent University um, to something more in depth with some Parent University presentations. Bringing back together the Cape Ann League superintendents, there's a lot of turnover in the Cape Ann League this year. There's at least four, uh, three to four new superintendents. Some have moved within the area, but they're new to their district. And I think this is a good time to see where folks are. There's a few other districts that are in the Cape Ann League that have been considering this, but no one is implementing yet. And so it would be a good time for 1920 for us to reconvene that group and see where we are. It's OK to be the first, but it does make a lot of sense to have a sense of where others are and, and to look at this together as a group. So that's really our ask and our request is to continue this exploration, perhaps in some greater detail with a few more public steps with the surveys and the parent presentations. But that's what we had for tonight. And I'm just wondering if we had any questions. Thank you very much. Mrs. Imbriano. Patrick, I think um, I was one of the options maybe um, on the busing to have the junior high and the high school start time the same, therefore the kids would all ride the bus together. Was that ever discussed? And what was the parents' reaction? Sure. So we, we haven't. Um, reached any level of that level yet with an actual option and a discussion or sharing out of a, of a model. Within our small group here, we did discuss that as a possible challenge concern, just that, you know, if we were to put students on the same bus, um, you know, that that might be something that would be of concern if you're having younger, younger middle school students with older high school students as a concern. That there are some possibilities where that kind of a solution might save on the number of buses, but it doesn't completely reduce it. So we looked at it at that level. It wouldn't completely reduce the number of buses to make it feasible, um, but it certainly hasn't reached the level where we've circulated that idea and we've received parent feedback because we, we've only kept this discussion within our group at this time. And will that be one of the questions maybe then on the survey? If, if we get to that point, so what we would do is we, we would study some of the options and try to come up with obviously the least... Um, the ones that pre present the least amount of challenges. If that were to be an option, that would be a question that we'd try to perceive. But I know that we've talked about in our group that one of the things when we brought the middle school, high school here together was that there were some concerns about the sixth graders and the seniors, right? And so we having separate buildings, separate cafeterias, sixth grades in sort of a separate area, separate buses, separate entrances was always well received. Um, I know some of our parents here have said, but you know what? We've also got five, six years of data now that it's worked very well with everyone being together. And so maybe some of those, those concerns could be assuaged a little bit with the, with the, the data. Um, but if that is a, a good solution that maybe is financially feasible or, or a great option, we would put that forward with some questions. But we're still a few steps away from that yeah. now. I, I, I can't, ex uh, can't express enough how we, although we have discussed internally a lot of different things, options and whatnot, we recognize that um, until we uh, 
are, have reached a point where we are confident in the options that we're talking about, that, that we've vetted them in the with the administration, and also to some extent with the public just by increasing our communication strategy that, you know, <clears throat> this is not the time to start talking about specific time changes just because it just, it, it just leads to confusion and, and you know, um, uh, uh, sort of misunderstanding what where we're at right now. So we've, we've been very careful about that, I think, which has been, I think, a, a good approach. Yeah, I would just say that, the, you know, the, the headline really is not we're changing or anything. Nothing's right. changing yet. <laughs> right. You know, and so I, you know, when it, even when we put out our, our Blackboard Connect or our school letter article, I got a call from an after school program, from a religious ed program. Is something going to change for the fall? Because I need to know in this. Right. You know, so we would, any changes that we would be making would be, would be a year out. We'd, we'd have right. plenty of notice to all those programs to consider all of those after school programs, all those before school programs would have plenty of time on a change that would be implemented. And, and I would also say um, that even in the, in, even in, as Patrick put it, the are asked today, there's no um, um, end point yet, right? We, we're not saying that, okay, by the end of next year, we'll have proposals, right? We, we, we don't know that, that that's where we'll be. We, we just want to sort of continue this process. Mm -hmm. Um, and for the two of you, are any of the other committee members here? Yes, many of them. Can you just raise your hand and say your name? <laughs> they're oh, very committed. Here, they're a very That's committed awesome. group. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great I, representative group. Yeah, Could you thank just you. state here? Okay. <laughs> I was really hoping we get there. I think. Right. <laughs> <laughs> It just it's nice to I probably won't remember your names, but it's you know <laughs> And Mr. Colleen. And Mr. Colleen oh, is also right. on the committee. Keep hiding over there. <laughs> <laughs> well thank you guys for your hard work. I know it's it's a lot to go through and it seems like you're just kinda of stuck in the mud and the wheels are turning, but eventually it'll find Okay. And I think sitting Damn. in our seats we think about all of those challenges in the the thoroughness that went into that list, I'm sure that list took some time. Um, I can see it because almost every single thing that crossed through my head was up there. So I, I genuinely appreciate. You can all tell us later which ones work. didn't. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. I mean, there's so many things that swirl through our heads on the hurdles and the fact that you're taking this thoughtful approach and are gonna, you know, look at those head on and taking the time to think about that. And like you said, I'm a huge advocate. If you're gonna do it, do it right don't go halfway yep. so the fact that you even outlined that it, it seems like you're just on the right track which is great yeah. Chris uh, Patrick yes. um, <clears throat> you had a slide where you talked about um, the different uh, benefits that getting fuller and the right amount and the right time of sleep for for adolescents can yield and um, given that a number of rel rather local schools have implemented changes like we're thinking about implementing uh, is there data yet to show ways in which their teens have improved in any of those categories? We we do have we have some uh, certainly anecdotal data, and we have someone here from that was telling me on the way in just about students right waking up and being more more alert in in first period things like that. Um, I know that they are collecting data at the schools. They are putting out surveys to staff, students, teachers, and so some of the results of our survey they've linked us and they've they've been willing to share those things with us as well. Um, there's also plenty of data from studies that, that's coming out as well. And that's, um, you know, th there's all of the data is in those links that we provided. And we can give you some more of that, too, as well, if you're, if you're interested. Sure. I think it's fair to say that a lot of the studies, and there are a lot of good studies out there that, that talk about this, you know, they, they show a link, uh, not necessarily, uh, you know, it, it's hard to get causality in, yeah. in, in this yeah, kind sure. of thing. Certainly, certainly, you know, can you say, uh, Changing the start times will improve test scores. That's impossible to say just because there's so many so other many factors, variables yeah. going yeah. into yeah. test scores, as we talked about, from year to year to year. Um, so it's really hard to tease that out. But I think this kind of data is, is will be really interesting. The, you know, sort of more local uh, survey data from surrounding districts will be meaningful. Right. Yeah. Like we talk about, it's 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 you know, if 
in whatever direction this goes, it's going to be a, a big change for a huge percentage of the town. Yep. Mm -hmm. so I think the more um, that they can see success, or the we can see success locally, the, the, the easier it becomes to understand that. Absolutely. So I, I have a, a comment or two and a question, a mm -hmm. very simple question up front, but why were school start times ever put at 7 a.m.? I mean, is there, was there ever a specific reason that they started at 7 a.m. or, or not? And so, some of our folks know this, and it's also, it, it's, it's, not as, uh, his, it's not been around as long as we think. Did, who, who wants to jump in? I some, can't remember yeah. the data exactly, but it did say somewhere that it changed at some, about 30, some, maybe 30 years ago, yeah. where it changed to be an earlier time. And I think it was, it was spread out of schools, and they didn't feel like there was enough busing, because it didn't used to be as much, they used to have busing, that wasn't a piece of it. So when we started to get the technology and everything coming into it, it did change. I don't have actual data for you exactly. Mm -hmm. It does seem to be an issue. I'm just, I'm just curious, because it seemed mm -hmm. like, yeah. You always hear, like, well, I did it when I grew up or whatever, but it's like... I, I had no memory of when my start, high school start yeah. times were, but were maybe, sleeping. maybe I didn't get enough sleep, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just remembered I didn't like getting up. Um, yeah, exactly. yeah, from what I've read, it's more 60s and 70s, not even like so many other things in education started in the 20s, 30s. This is a little bit later, yeah. um, and that, those are some changes. And I think that's what it was driven by finances, buses, getting people there in time. And, yeah, as a former high school teacher, I can remember, and we do things in the middle school that are great. Like, we, you know, at the middle school, we rotate who you're seeing first um, so that you're not always seeing the same teacher at first thing in the morning because it is it is tough as a as a high school teacher I remember the students just it, it wasn't the same experience for my seven o'clock kids as it was for my ten o'clock kids you know so I think it's something to be considered um, but there's there's much more beyond that piece of it as well with um, with their health I mean and, and I, I just think it seems like this has been percolating in the background for years now so I'm glad that it's I'm glad that it's actually coming to a head, and I just hope that there can be a final conclusion from this, whether it takes a year or two years or whatever it is. But again, I mean, I don't think you have to sell me on the science of it all, and I know that there will be some people who have to sell on the science of it all, but you're not going to convince everybody ever, and so it doesn't mean that you don't move forward with something. But I do think that you outlined all the considerations. I was I was literally writing things down, and then I saw it and I crossed it off. Yeah. So like. <laughs> Good. You know, I mean, it, you, you've, you've focused on the things that I was thinking about, um, so I appreciate that, and thank everybody for volunteering their time to do that. Yeah. I'll, add, I'll add one thing that I'm, I'm excited about. I think Sheila, especially, is a tech person, too, and a lot of us. We're trying to think, too, maybe something that I haven't heard a lot is sort of a 21st century solution to some of this, and, and thinking about how we can use technology, shifts in place, flexible learning, personalized learning, all those things that we're doing, there may be a way to solve some of this that way. Um, and, and by shifting start times, by just shifting what we think of as what it means to be in class and to be in school. And I'm not going to get into too much detail with that, but I'm, things we're talking about in our group is maybe there are some creative ways around this that don't involve um, as much of a, I'll say, like a 20th century solution, which is just physically moving where people are at certain times. There's different ways with learning now to do that. So we're going to think about some of those solutions, too, as maybe a fourth or fifth option to consider. So that's what we would be, one of the things we'd be working on. Yep. When I'm working from home today, my uh, yeah. my kids could be. I'm just That's uh, uh, it's a skill that every kid needs to learn, right? That's right. I and mean, yeah. it's everyone's doing it. So okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay. Look forward to hearing more updates. Thank you, Patrick. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you for staying. Thank late. you all. Okay. <laughs> We're so excited that someone actually came to, to I know. See us work. It's, this is like <laughs> we were thinking of keeping you till the very end, so there was people here at the end. <laughs> Speaking of start times, they were told to be I here know. at 7.15. I know. Well. <laughs> there it is. Okay, so. I, I held my tongue when I saw that because I'm like, I don't know if that's going to work out, but okay. Oh, well. <laughs> okay, so I guess we have to go back to one can piece of continued business, and yes, you guys can leave if you Thank want. Thank you, folks. Yes. Um, yeah, we didn't schedule a vote on this. It was just you, you're getting the implied. Uh, 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 well, the, the, the next one you might want, I mean, the next one is the continued business if there's any update on the superintendent uh, search no, process. Okay. I mean, if I, oh. <laughs> that's on there, on there. So yeah, if any, it is. Mr. Yeah. McGowan, Mrs. Uh, Imbriano, any update on that? Imbriano? Um, we have a 14-person um, search committee, and we met last Tuesday and had an organizational meeting. Yep. Um, we talked about having um, questions. Uh, we worked with Glenn Kucher, who is the um, chief executive officer of MASK, 
and uh, he gave us like a 64 page um, paper of questions that you know you might want to ask and stuff so we went through that and um, one of the the members thought it would be a good idea to have like themes you know yeah. financial management administration um, working with the community th those kinds of things and then to take the pit the questions and put them underneath the theme and then from that um, I, I collected all of their um, suggestions and I have a running document so tomorrow we have another meeting and we'll take those questions and the themes and then narrow it down to the questions that we'll ask the applicants that way all of the applicants are asked the same question so that we have a good sense of you know um, sort of apples to apples yeah, comparisons. yeah yeah thank you um, uh, we have a pretty uh, tight timeline it's quite ambitious um, we have the posting for three weeks um, so the posting closes on June 11th and then on June 13th we will review all of the um, applicants that have come in and you know find the ones that we think are good and then um, we will give those two three four however many um, that information to the school committee and then the school committee yeah I think I think once the applications close we'll decide who we want to do interviews with <clears throat> and then after that process we'll uh, hopefully narrow that down even further to uh, uh, a reasonable group for the committee to consider yeah um, I think we had a really group good group of people in in the search committee um, if I'll be in I'll have to eat my words if it ever comes out something comes out with a seven to seven tie because I said <laughs> chances are of that happening are, are are slim but uh, no I think it's a really good group and I think we quickly realized that the 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 question of the questions was more than we were going to be able to tackle in this last meeting so we scheduled this extra meeting just to sort of finalize those questions yep. um, so that that was that was the big a lot of goal. good ideas a lot of yep. good suggestions um, it was a, it was a, it was a very good yeah, first a lot meeting. of different perspectives yeah um, professional business business related perspectives and, and um, it's a good mix yeah. So we're hoping to have our interviews on this 18th and 19th yep. and then suggest to the school committee on the 23rd yeah. and hopefully have 24th. 23rd 24th. Mm -hmm. to 20, hear 23rd is a Sunday 23rd is a Sunday so 24th we should, okay yeah. yeah sorry excuse me yeah 24th um, and then uh, hopefully we'll if all goes right, right. <laughs> yes uh, we'll have someone uh, a decision made um, by the beginning middle of, of Ju July yeah, okay. yeah. And that's it it seems like we've got some interest which is good mm -hmm. so, yeah well, currently it's there's good. 11 applicants yep. good thank you very much thank you okay now let's try to move through a little bit quicker <laughs> financial the uh, end of year financial report Mr. Connolly, yes, would you like um, to present? Thank you. So it's typical um, that we provide you a copy of the end of the year financial report um, annually. And essentially, as a reminder, this report is essentially represents um, all the expenditures and revenue receipts that were um, either expended or received throughout fiscal year 2000. Uh, 918 so this represents activity through June 30 2018 so every school district in the Commonwealth is required to uh, submit an end of the year financial report which reflects all this information and in, in data um, you have until September 30th to uh, submit the, the report it's essentially a, a sources and use document um, and it's required to be audited by an outside independent audit firm um, by March 31st of every year so we typically do provide you with that report around you know May or June this time time frame um, I'm happy to report that uh, the report was uh, done accurately and there were uh, no findings reflected in the report so I don't know, I think the bottom line is it was perfect there were no <laughs> correct <laughs> errors yeah. at all it was it was a good, it was a good report so, so we're thank pleased you for to that. see that and for that and uh, one one comment I will actually make is I know that you said to me when we were talking about food service workers that 
because of your accounting, they actually, you were actually asked to present um, at a CLE for uh, people about, because again, some of the report, financial reports that we've been doing for student um, accounts in particular right. have been, again, they, they, you were specifically asked to present at about it because of the exceptional work that you do. So I, mean, I think that's just, oh, thank you. It's, it's, it's great. I mean, it's great that you, you are on top of everything your team is. And I mean, I think one year there might've been like one small correction and nothing this year. So great. No, I appreciate thank you. that. Mr. Buckley, thank you. Thank you very much. Comments, questions? Michael Good. does an exceptional job in everything that he takes on. So. He <laughs> absolutely does. I think I know you all know that. But. Yeah. Well, he's like, he'll, he'll say in the meeting, I don't know if I'll get to that. And then the next morning, he's like, oh, I got it done already. Well, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> well that's great. Oh, uh, during our discussions in the school, school start time committee, Patrick's like, we, we need to be very specific about what we, what, what we ask of Michael, because if we ask him, He's going to spend a lot of time on it. <laughs> well, let's be very careful what we do. What we ask so we don't say. Some of us remember Radar O'Reilly and MASH, right? Ah. <laughs> That's Michael. He knows what I'm looking for before I even have to ask there him. You so, there you go. There you go. Thank you. Uh, you don't know who Radar is, do you? <laughs> I'll have to show you a clip sometime. <laughs> it's a compliment. <laughs> it is. He was the most efficient person it in the Army. It is a compliment. I All right. Wasn't he a little... So the uh, proposed just, school committee meeting like, schedule for next he was year... Just off. Seems like we're going to be on Monday night Everybody still. Show one. You want to move them? Um, no. Oh. Thursdays? No. Saturdays? We'll get more people. Thursdays would be great. One more, Saturdays? One more wake up. But I didn't dare go there. Um, any, anybody have any comments, questions on the schedule? Looked okay to me. But it's fairly really straight. Our meeting forward. schedule? No. Yes. The meeting schedule. Um, I have I something think that what we've done. Have we, the only question I would make sure is have we looked at any holidays? I know that. I, I did. Okay. Um, I, 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 I was. Hope I, I intended to avoid anything as a yeah. conflict. Okay. Good. And um, the town meeting obviously will be to be determined. Correct? It's October seventh. Uh, the June one. The June one, yes. The June yeah, one will be to down. be determined. Yeah. That town meeting, because mm -hmm. we're not necessarily okay. doing it. That if we day. go, if we go by the schedule of it this year, it's it's June. Yeah. Would that is that when the prom would be or not? It would not be. Okay. So that would be. I, I had one question. I I can't seem to find my calendar, but um, wasn't there a gap? In October, of, that was quite um, seven to twenty-one. Seven twenty-one. But seven, weeks. but twenty-one is 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 blank. Was that meant to be a meeting? It just, it, it's meant to be a meeting. It just just says no every once in a while there'll be something that is. Yeah, there'll be a meeting. It's rare, but there'll be a meeting where there isn't something prescribed. To regular be regular scheduled thing. Okay. And in fact, I'm thinking we may have even canceled a meeting in October this year. We may have because yeah. there ended up being Janine. Do you remember? You were the chairman, and I, I'm recalling reaching out to you and saying there was really nothing. Yeah, yeah. There, there was a one, at least one case. I think it was, and I think it was might the October been, meeting. Yeah, it might have been even that same one. But. Yeah, it was going to be the talent show, the uh, school committee talent. School show. committee talent show. Yeah, we'll oh, pencil that in. Great. I like that. Okay, we'll pencil that in. Okay, so um, do we have to have Halloween a Halloween sweater. Bro. I have one other question yes. about this. Do you think there's any way we could get meeting uh, requests or meeting yeah. reminders? Uh, sent for all of these dates. That would be really annoying for someone to oh, do. Oh, I know what you're saying. Yeah, um, sure. And then and then changes are easy because do like you can just like I like I do with the subcommittees. Yeah. yeah, I can do that. That's a lot of work, right. but no, it's not. Yeah, no, we put them in the calendar anyway. Yeah, they're in the district calendar. So yeah. all I have to do is yeah, is do the uh, invite ad. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I hope everyone would find that useful. Oh, that's fine. I yeah. would find it very. If you are good with these dates. Yeah. I'll. We'll load them in, you know. Yeah, and then it the just makes it easy to do weeks. changes too. Yeah, exactly. I actually, have, yep. I actually have on my phone all of the. You probably don't want all all the town meetings. There's a way to get all the town meetings on there. On, so. I don't even know how I got that. I know I got it one time. Yeah, I don't know if yeah. I want to have that or not. Okay, do we have to have a vote on this or anything? No. Um, Meeting schedule. You vote to approve. Yeah, I have, can I have a. Notes. Yeah, can I have a, a vote to a, a motion to approve? Motion to approve the meeting calendar. Second. Second. Okay, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Unanimous. Everyone's a tied one to one. Oh, good. <laughs> okay. Mr. Colleen just uh, texted me. <laughs> Capital did, Improvement Planning Committee. Oh, that's what you've been doing. <laughs> so, so, Mr. Buckley, yes, the, Mr. Connolly's uh, term oh, yeah, see. is due to expire on June mm -hmm. 30th. So, um, I spoke, uh, this comes, goes back to a conversation I had with Mrs. Stats at the town clerk's office regarding. Mrs. Boutwell's appointment, um, and it was at that time that we we discovered that Mr. Connolly's appointment was due to expire, and he needs to be assuming that the committee wants to 
um, have Mr. Connolly serve on the Capital Improvements Planning Committee, again, that he would need to be uh, reappointed for a three-year term. Okay. And so the, the only question I have is, so if we appoint him, that the firm confirmation he'll be here for the next, to fill out that term, right? The Absolutely. Three-year term? He is locked in. Okay. <laughs> but I, I was just checking on that one. Yeah. I didn't hear from Mr. Connolly yet, but. Sure. <laughs> really. I didn't mean to speak. <laughs> um, okay. I mean, any, any discussion? I mean, I'd, I'd be in favor of Michael. So. I'd like to make a motion to appoint Michael Conley to the Capital Improvement Committee, Planning Second. Committee. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you, Michael. Thank you. Okay. And, and congratulations. Uh, yeah. <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> right. Okay. No minutes this time. Budget update. Mr. Connolly. Yes. Thank you. Um, we do have a budget update, um, which is essentially reflects financial activity just about through the month of May. And as it been in our practice, we do break that down through expenses and payroll. Um, so as you know, over the, the really the, the next you know four weeks or so, we're in the process of closing out fiscal year 2019. And I'm happy to report that really the, the majority of our expenses have remained within budgeted ranges this fiscal year. As we've discussed in the past and has been our typical practice, we have begun prepaying special education tuition costs for fiscal year 20 with the year end available funds. Um, the FY 2019 budget, as you may recall, was predicated upon our ability uh, to identify $100,000 to prepay out of district tuitions. Um, the, law, the law allows us to prepay up to three months of the tuition costs. Um, I'm happy to report that we've been able to meet and even exceed this amount, and this will certainly help provide some level of flexibility in fiscal year 2020. Um, we continue to monitor the cost of utilities closely, um, certainly at, um, at the new high school and middle school. As reflected on the report, I'm pleased to report that all utility costs will remain within budget and we will have certainly have funds mainly in electricity and water line items to repurpose. Um, we report out on the food service program on a monthly basis and um, I was pleased with the performance in the month of April which tends to be more of a challenging month for the food service program where the program earned a net profit of a little over $6,000. Um, mail sold per day was certainly up on average 5% across all five schools when compared to last year. So at this point, really through the month of April, I've yet to see May, May numbers at this point, um, but the performance is right in line to operate a break-even program, and we anticipate if we finish strong, we can even do a little bit better than break-even um, if we finish strong in May and June. Um, on the salary end of the report, everything is certainly in line, and, and there's no surprises. Um, we certainly had a need at times to appoint and hire long-term substitutes to fill extended leave of absences, but uh, I'm happy to report that it appears that we, our substitute budget will remain um, within the budgeted amount. Um, and overall, I think we're in solid financial standing to close out fiscal year 2019 and achieve the carryover funds that were identified during the fiscal 20 budget development process. So with that being said, I'll open up to any questions. Questions, anyone? So uh, two quick questions. So for the meals, is that, are we in the black yet for meal, for the food service or are we uh, um, close? We are close, okay. yeah. I know about year to date? From yeah. year to date, because we, we anticipate the month of May well, we'll there's, earn there's, less, there's less expenses in May, and then there's, yeah. Right, and the, with the longer operating days, we should be in the black at the end of okay. this month when I see the numbers. And then yeah. for substitutes, I know last year there was, uh, there was a challenge finding substitutes, and there was some advertising done. Is there, is there hopefully going to be a goal to maybe even try to proactively start even this summer to be advertising to, because it seemed like we, we needed to fill a lot of positions this year. So yep, I think sure we we'll um, we'll certainly be aggressive with our with advertising and try to attract and retain uh, retain you know quality substitutes both on the the long term substitutes when those are needed. We've we've been had having success with doing that, and the challenge had typically been um, the the per diem the, the the daily substitute. So we'll we'll run some advertisements um, ongoing throughout the summer and try to. Uh, 
you know, re in increase and replenish that pool. But uh, the fill rates as of late has been much better. Okay. Um, so I'm hoping uh, we'll certainly be able to continue to have success with that. This, this may um, be a silly idea, but I wonder if, if it would ever make sense to do even like an orientation at some point where if there was anybody interested in possibly learning about it, there was just, a, you know, an hour meeting where you, yeah, anybody could come to it and hear what it, what what it entailed being a substitute. Just an idea. I mean, if okay. we if we're yeah, you know. no, we'll certainly um, consider that and look yeah. at where we're at. You can say it's silly. That's fine. Um, <laughs> no, I think it, we've we've done the last time we did something similar to that was when we moved to the ASOP system, mm -hmm. which is the automated attendance system. That's several years back now, but we we did some um, orientations and some trainings and some informational meetings to orientate our subs to that system and talk just in generalities about um, what the, the job entails. So I think it's important that we have a, a high quality, um, reliable, consistent pool to turn to and um, we'll, we'll continue to try to do that. Excellent. Mike, what's our uh, daily sub rate? So the daily sub rate is $80. Um, which is about the median, the average. Um, it's not, certainly not the highest in the area, but it's not, it's not the lowest. We, we did increase it about a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll, we'll continue to watch that. It's prob we'd probably be due for an increase um, you know, in, another, in a year's time. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll, we'll look at that. Um, but we're, we're, about, we're about the average mm -hmm. right now. So. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Bernard had no objections, so he, he's... He's on board with all of that. <laughs> and you want to talk oh, about, yeah, the member about, about the uh, students? Yeah, so there's another supplemental yeah. report um, this month in, w regarding our student activities. So um, we did include in the packet is the student activity quarter three report. This report reflects activity through March 31st, 2019. So again, and according to the our new regulations, um, we have been doing quarterly reports out to the, the full committee. So reflected in this memorandum and report is the certified reconciled quarterly account balances at all five schools. These are reconciled to the um, bank statements. Um, and then it is greater detail in terms of the accounts that have the sub accounts. Those would be at the middle school and the high school. Um, so I think, you know, Overall, I think things are going you know, really well with the student activity accounts this year. Um, and I appreciate Mr. Buckley bringing that up. I, I, I did uh, present in, in amongst my peers and talk about adherence to some of the new student activity regulations across, uh, across the state um, with a handful of other, other school districts and, and some of the auditors that have been out throughout the Commonwealth auditing student activity accounts. So it's certainly been a hot topic as of late over the last couple of years, but uh, you know, I think, I think we've been doing a, a pretty solid job in, in adhering to not only our school committee policy, but as well as the, the, the guidelines and the regulations in the state. So that being said, I'll open up to any questions on that report. Um, how is, remember when Notorious and Maskers Yes. Hard to do their own. How has that transition been going? And and I was trying to find it and I can't remember what yeah, it was called. Yeah. So I think, um, well, I think things have, I think we've transitioned pretty well into that process for this first year. So what you're referring to is the fact that we now have a performing arts right. revolving account and the the new fee. The new fee. So the, those uh, participating in performance performing arts activities now will pay the fee, and that fee would be deposited in the revolving account. Um, and then the ticket sales for those performances uh, would also get deposited in the revolving account. So what you saw was the maskers, which is reflected in the high school uh, page. That that balance has certainly gone down. Yeah. You, you would see that balance was a lot higher at the, about a year ago, at the beginning of the year. So I think certainly I appreciate um, the you know Allison Kane's done a really good job working closely with um, the business office, myself, and um, the accounting staff to. Um, during this transition year, and I, I think it's been, uh, you know, relatively seamless. We've sort of flowed, in, flowed into uh, that that new process, and um, you know, the maskers are saw obviously the, a student activity account, a student activity club. So the fundraising activity that they do do obviously is the receipts that are now flowing into student activity because that would be defined as the student money. 
Um, but then the the performing arts related sponsored activities, their their productions, um, as well as the school committee fee now flows into the, the revolving account. But I think we've done a good job working pretty closely and communicating pretty closely with the club advisors during this change of over what where what goes where and where the expenses need to come from. So just as an add on to that, Michael and I hosted a meeting last Thursday. Afternoon? Yes, Thursday afternoon. Thursday afternoon yep. with um, the middle and high school administration, um, Sabita from the business office, Allison Kane, Linda Burke from the high school office. Yep. And we, we held a, a kind of a, 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 a you know, a so-called year-end kind of debrief of this because it was new. Um, and we sought their input on what they saw as having gone well, where there were maybe areas for improvement. And so I think largely what came out of that meeting was how the payments can be made using family ID, and is there a way to streamline that so that, yeah. you know, to, to kind of lessen the confusion. But overall, I think, you know, there, there was some confusion initially, like so-called last summer, when people were going on and trying to pay and not understanding, well, if I made the $200 fee, do I, what constitutes the extra 100? So we're trying to, we think we came up with a third option that's gonna allow for people to, you know, more, more easily select which option is applicable to them for their child. Um, but as Michael said, we, you know, I think, for the, you know, anytime you're introducing a new fee, there's always the possibility for there to be some pushback, yeah. and there really wasn't. People were very responsive, and, and I'm not going to say they embraced it, but they worked with us. And I think what we have in our favor on something like that is the product, you know, and, and I think we put out a pretty good fine arts program, and I think people see what the commitment is of the district to to, to do that, and and. Um, it, you know, it, it's gone well. I think, that's, but I, yeah. I think it's important for you folks to know that we did have that meeting at Michael's initiation, just to kind of kind of debrief and see, you know, how did it go, and, and, and we, we, we think we learned some things from that hour hour discussion that we'll enact for um, for September. But nothing that nothing that changes the spirit of what we're trying to do. Maybe right. it's just more to make it kind of easier for the end user, if you will. Mm. Cool. Yes. Thank you. Any other okay. comments, questions? Okay, moving on. Staffing, Mr. Bernard. So thank you, Mr. Buckley. I, I do, I'm going to start, you know, probably for the next few meetings, I'll have for you a more you know, a staffing report, more than I might typically have for you during the school year. But um, we have, we had, um, I think we made an effort this year to, to um, post some vacancies earlier than we, than we have in the past. Um, and these are largely due to either um, retirement or um, the, some of the new staff that we identified in the, in the budget development as, as, um, as, as postings that are anticipated pending a town meeting vote. So I, I just would like to share with you tonight and then I'll, I'll kind of expand this each meeting now for the next few meetings for you. Um, but I'd like to welcome um, to the Little School the following uh, new staff. As a general kindergarten paraprofessional, Jennifer Casoli Vant. Um, is a full, full day kindergarten teacher, Kristen D. Filippo. We're, we're very happy to welcome Kristen back to the district. She had been, she had been, um, um, she'd been let go from us um, a year ago because of, it was a reduction in force on the kindergarten numbers. We just needed, we needed a position. She did a very nice job for us. She did find a job for the year, saw that we had an opening um, for a full day position this year and applied and we, we welcomed her back. She did a nice job for us. So I'm particularly happy about that. Um, Kelly McCarthy is a new grade three teacher at the little school, and um, Jenny Dagan is um, going to assume the .6 uh, full-time equivalent reading teacher position. That's become vacant because of an internal uh, shift of uh, who had been the reading teacher to the available kindergarten teacher position at the little school. For um, all three elementary schools, so kind of higher, I have it labeled on the report as kind of hiring in the district as a speech language pathologist is Jillian Rizzuto. And at the high school, um, Laura DeBacco has been hired as a new um, secretary in the athletic department. Robin Foreman, who's worked with us for a long time, has done a very nice job, is, um, is retiring um, in September. But we've, we've been able to secure somebody now. Um, and there'll be a, a short transition period with her in, in the late summer before Robin, um, before Robin leaves. <clears throat> and then two special education teachers at the high school, uh, Benjamin Golding and Kristen Rybicki. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Kids and donations. Start. Mr. McGowan's time to shine. My, my favorite time. 
<laughs> Mr. <laughs> Chairman, I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of $50 from Mary Staples for a scholarship to be given to a graduating senior to be chosen by administration in memory of James J. Chambers, husband of high school guidance secretary Ann Chambers. Second. Who's doing uh, the seconds? <laughs> I handed it. Um, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of $50 from Kathleen Apigian to be given to a graduating senior who attended the bachelor school. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of $150 from Laura Lee and John Loftus for a scholarship to be given to a graduating senior to be chosen by administration in memory of James J. Chambers, husband of high school guidance secretary Ann Chambers. Second. Uh, the only thing I'll say in discussion, I think it's great when somebody who works here, then when somebody passes, want to right. give back to the students here. So yep. that is definitely appreciated. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a total donation of $350 from the Hood Elementary School Parents Association to be used toward the June Maker Day. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of $500 from Nicole Fernandez Gamer to be used toward the fifth grade Can Canopy Lake field trip at the Bachelor School. Second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Yes, it's been. Yeah. I move that the school yeah, committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of $1,000 from Reading Cooperative Bank for a scholarship to be given to a graduating senior to be chosen by the administration. Second. Sorry. All those in favor? <laughs> Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. And this was committee vote to accept with gratitude a total donation of $1,500 from Fifth Revolution. The gift amounts are disseminated as follows Batchelder Elementary, 500, Hood Elementary, 250, Little Elementary, 250, Middle School, 250, and the High School, 250. Second. But it was in the PTO. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. So the little wasn't the one that had the most this That's year? That's why I went past that. So mm -hmm. I don't know what that was for. But I'm, I'm going I mean, past that. They're a competitive that. group. Believe I'm going me. past when that. When the results come out, you have no idea. They're, they're all jockeys. The batch parents said nothing, so I moved on. <laughs> I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude the total donation of $1,000 from the Hood Elementary School Parents Association to be used to make visuals around the school for math plan. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. I move I noticed that. that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a total mm -hmm. donation of $1,315 from various donors, mm -hmm. from friends and family of Charles E. Jones for the Charles E. Jones Educator Excellence Award, in memory of Charles E. Jones, former middle school assistant principal, and with uh, your indulgence, I'll read the names, uh, Nancy Matos, John and Lorraine Sylvia, Christopher and Yuki Haynes, David Griggs, Dennis Maraska, Gordon and Jane Brown, Thomas and Susan Cowell, Ann Donovan, Robert and Ann Cottle, Lee and Pamela Dickey, Richard and Deborah Delvo, Mark and Judith Hall, Nelson and Diana Rose, Patricia Delaney, Niccolo and Maria Damiano. Second. Okay, any discussion? I'll just, the only discussion I'll say is this is obviously a continuation. Yes. This is, there's been a number of donors. Um, Honoring Mr. Jones, so it, I think it's, it's up to about twenty-six hundred dollars, I believe. It's a it's a testament to. I mean, some of these folks probably had him as a were students under him. So. Students Many of them were students. Yeah. 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 So, okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude the total donation of $1,500 from the Hood Elementary School Parents Association for the Eagle Scout Project School Storage Shed. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude in-kind donations for the above list of school activities and expenses from December 2018 to March 2019 from the LD Batchelder Elementary School Parents Association Totaling $3,987.50. Second. 
Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. And finally, I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude the total donation of $4,055 from the Hood Elementary School Parents Association to be used for various field trips, including grade five. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. And as the chair usually says, we are very grateful to this community that the uh, individual people and the PTOs really step up to provide. All right. Yep. Um, okay, subcommittee update. Mr. McGowan, you had your first meeting at NORCAM. How did that go? I did not. Oh, it didn't happen. I actually, I ran into somebody and heard that, so. But you met people. So. There you go. Okay, the finance planning team met this morning and since I'm chair, I guess that means I get to ask you for the update. <laughs> oh no, you can pay I always go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh um we went through the warrant. Yes. Well, I, I got the last couple of them anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We just did quick revenue, nothing's changed and went through the town warrant, so Okay. Just maybe for Mr. Papabasilio's sure. I want to explain. So what 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 will happen this on Monday for town meeting is the town meeting is at seven, but the committee generally meets a half an hour beforehand at my office to just talk about applicable town meeting warrant articles. So just I don't want you to be confused about where to go. So no, I appreciate that. Six thirty first at my office. Thank you. And I would have I would have been right here. It's usually it's yeah. usually very quick. You know, just a review of any applicable articles. There is one in particular of interest to the school department of mm -hmm. um, the establishment of a special education reserve fund, and mm -hmm. then we'll go to um, the Performing Arts Center, and is, we're usually down in the, in the uh, lower right-hand corner of the stage area. About as far away as they can possibly. Yeah. 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 So, so okay. Just, Thank you. Thank clear you. Clear on where to go. Perfect. And, and I on the schedule because the finance planning team met this morning, we didn't have the date for the next meeting, but it's July 18th. Taking notes at 8:15. Okay, so to quickly go through that, athletic subcommittee is meeting on June 12th at 12:30 p.m. Fine arts subcommittee June 13th at 2:30 p.m. Policy subcommittee June 13th at 3:30 p.m. Those are all in the superintendent's conference room. Um, we are going to have a contract subcommittee, by the way, but I don't know if it needs to be on there. Dor NORCAM board of directors uh, is June. Be, yeah, that's what the 21st. 21st, I think we had it reserved. NORCAM Board of Directors, June 27th at 7 p.m. at NORCAM. Finance Planning Team, as you just mentioned, July 18th at 8.15 a.m. Administrative Report, Mr. Bernard. Thank you. I do have um, a couple of things. I'm sorry, the contract subcommittee is 8.30? 8.30. Right? 830. 830. Yeah. Okay. So why 7.30? The contract, contract subcommittee. Review subcommittee. And that's in my office, too. And when is it? June 21st at 8.30. Thank you, Cindy. So you should all have a couple of things for me uh, tonight. Um, the first is kind of upholding my uh, one of my obligations as the district's um, representative to the C Collaborative and the North Shore Education Consortium is to provide you with periodic reports um, issued by the executive directors of those two educational collaboratives. So I have done that. Um, so they're attached. Um, for your um, information. <clears throat> the second thing is, um, you might recall back a couple of meetings ago, I don't think it was the last meeting, it was I think the one before, but it was recent anyway, that we hosted a learning tour as part of our work as a district with the, um, with the Maple Initiative. And I spoke to you about, I think it happened to be on a meeting, I think it happened on the day of the meeting, if I'm not mistaken, it was at the end of April. Um, we had hosted um, people from a number of different communities here to see about some of the work that we were doing as a district at the middle school and the high school around personalized learning. I, I, I came across, um, by way of Dr. Daly, um, some, some public relations information that was put out by Maple um, that I've attached for your packet. I just thought it would be nice for you to see what um, is out now kind of in the public domain through Maple about some of their observations of, of, of what they saw. Um, when they came to the middle high school um, for that day. Um, and I think there's just some really ni nice um, uh, commentary on uh, what they saw in classrooms and in the school. I mean, picking up on, on, on things that we do in the school um, to display student work and, and awards and accolades on Main Street. 
um, artwork, um, athletic awards and such, but also then, you know, some very pointed comments about what they observed in classrooms and how the district is working toward um, personalizer learning, which obviously then translates into enhanced, um, enhanced achievement. So I just I just thought it would be something nice for you to see. And the, the, the link is there, you know, the, the web address is there. They had a great video, too, didn't they? They had a great video, yeah, they did, I yeah. I came across that on Twitter from uh, Dr. Downs' uh, staff. And they're actually, speaking of that, I'm glad you mentioned that, because they're, they've actually been invited to the State House on, on Wednesday of this week. We have a lot going on at the State House this week. <laughs> um, we have a group of, of students from the robotics team that are going um, to the State House as part of a larger statewide initiative to be recognized for some of the work that they're, they're doing in robotics. And I, you might remember when we had that, um, there was the robot that kind of climbed. Do you remember, do you remember that? That demonstration yeah. with the robot that kind of climbed yeah. up the stairs. It, it was at the, I think it was at the Bachelor School. Yes. Thank you, Liz. Well, that, 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 that kind of work is what's being recognized across the state. We have some students going with, um, with Dan Downs and Mrs. Dasho, one of our, our digital learning teachers on Wednesday. So just a, you know, another example of something kind of cool going on in the schools. I figured if you get called the state house, it's either good or bad. So yeah, fortunately, not <laughs> fortunately. Wood. This week it's good. <laughs> fortunately, it's been good. So any correspondence? Uh, there is no correspondence tonight. Excellent. Okay, so future business on Friday. We're losing our seniors, so we're going to meet at 545 on Main Street and then take the walk down. And I don't know what the comment about shoes means, yeah, but... Um, I guess it goes down here, so. High heel <laughs> shoes can, you know, we don't want to pierce the turf. Right. Um, we can't wear these. We know the rules, yeah. yeah. I bought one. I, bought one. I did. I went on. I, I, I remember from myself. last year. Did you do? Oh. Yeah, oh. Did you do? <laughs> um, June 10th on Monday, we have town meeting, and so as Mr. Bernard just mentioned, at 6.30 we'll meet beforehand. We do have to talk about a couple of Warren articles that we'll be supporting, and hopefully. Um, June 17th, the regular meeting here at 6.30 p.m. And that is it. I have a motion to close. You certainly may. Second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.